YouTube. So, hello everybody. Welcome. This is Griffin Gaming. Welcome to Soul Citizens, and I'm here with a lovely and talented Green Eye Gal. <laughs> hey, Gigi. Hi, everyone. Hey, Griff. It's good to see you guys. I know I've been gone for a minute, so I'm back. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Well, we've got Gigi back, guys, and we've got a lot to cover. You guys know we didn't have a show last Friday. Hey, Standard. We didn't have a show last Friday. Uh, we took a break off. Last Sunday was our first Soul Citizens back, and this hey, is our night. first hey, Friday back. Hey, Kimmy. So we are going to tonight cover a lot of ground. Um, the first half is going to be really exciting. The second half, I can tell you now, is going to be a sleeper. So get you something to drink, something to eat. It's not a sleeper. It's a good SCL, but it, they kind of it's it's an hour. So we're going to try to cut through everything so that we're not on here like till four in the morning tonight uh, and <laughs> cover as much ground as we can. Um, so let's let's start off with the very first thing that happened this last week. So let me change my screens here. We're going to go to the miniature versions of us guys so we can talk about what's going on. Uh, the IAE was last week. We know that that wrapped up on, uh, was it Tuesday, I think, Gigi? The 2nd, December 2nd, or was that Wednesday? Yeah, I think that was Wednesday, right? It was Wednesday. Okay. And uh, I know you didn't get a chance to really monkey around because you had stuff going on in real life. But yeah. uh, what, did, what did you think about what you did see? I know you got a chance to sit in on some other people's live streams and stuff. Stuff and yes. see what was going on. What did you think? So of I it? thought it was really cool. I was kind of bummed out that I wasn't able to like join in all the fun, but I really did have a lot going on. But I did get to see some streams. Um, I am very lucky to have a lot of very kind and <laughs> affluent friends, so they got all the ships, <laughs> <laughs> which you're going to try to and ride I got on. to watch a lot of listen. Why buy when you can when just you can fly? fly. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's the new slogan, right? Okay. <laughs> no, but um I did get to watch, you know, some some run throughs and some walkthroughs. Really I thought the Star Runner was beautiful. The Nomad, I'm iffy on the aesthetics, but I like the the work, the workmanship of it. And I like what I think it's going to do once they get the bugs worked out. Um, mm -hmm. I got a cutty with the. Oh, you um, bought a cutty. Finally. <laughs> I got the cutty. You've been wanting a cutty forever. You've been talking about I upgrading did. to a cutty. I got the cutty with the best in show skin, and she's beautiful, and I love her. <laughs> now, now, you said that you had, if I'm remembering correctly, you had a, t a Titan and a Pisces. And you, I, I have a Titan I, I, and a Pisces. right? And I asked you about were you were you going to consider the uh, Nomad, but you said no. I'm going to probably just go right past that to the, to the cutters, cutting. right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So you didn't do. The, I didn't do a Nomad either. I I, I yeah. didn't. I passed on the Nomad as well. I, so. I feel like I would rather get the Cuddy and then just work for the Nomad. Yeah. You know, it's it's. It, you know, it's more simple to work for the Nomad than it would be for the Cuddy. So I feel like that's that's usually my deciding factor when I'm thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Is like what's going to be worth working for and what's not going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'm not going to work for a ninety. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but I will work for Pisces if I want one. So yeah. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I I thought that they did. No, a... fast car. You will not borrow my Pico. Once Pico gets here, Pico is not leaving. Oh, your Pico has now, in game Pico, sure. I, I think you ordered your Pico like around the time I ordered this. In fact, if I, I'm not wearing. Uh, you guys see, Gigi is wearing a Soul Citizen shirt tonight, and I'm usually wearing one. But tonight, my uh, Star Citizen shirt came in. If you guys can see it, it's that one that's got the weird stripe on it. You know, the half and half gray. I don't know if you can see it, but anyway, I've got that came in today, and it's really really cool. It's a really nice shirt. They had this on sale. Um, a couple weeks ago, but I mean, about three weeks ago, I think I bought oh, it. Yeah, and it was on sale for like 15 bucks. So if you're a subscriber, if they still have some, it's a great steal. So get you your star, official Star Citizen shirt. It took them about three weeks for it to get here. And um, I'm sure when Gigi's Pico comes in, she'll be more than happy to show it to us. So Oh, I am like already prepared to have it directly in front of the camera as soon as i get it like the first time i get it it's gonna be right here yeah. <laughs> for y'all <laughs> yeah yeah thanks fast cart 1950 if you're not a subscriber so it's still under 20 bucks it's not bad because sometimes the shirts can be kind of pricey so and it's not that bad it is a nice shirt 
Okay, uh, so that's IAE. Uh, we're not going to talk a lot about it. I mean, you guys already know we're, we're po past it. Uh, this yeah. Sunday show, just so we'll give you guys a little heads up, we're going to have uh, STL Youngblood on as our guest. And the title of the show this week coming up is called No Deposit, No Return. And it's talking about the, in the value, investment, the spending that goes into Star Citizen. Gigi, did you know? Gigi, did you know? Did you know that <laughs> Star Citizen, CIG, broke their record from Invictus and made, um, I think it was, by the time it was all over with, it was more than that. It was 16 when they got done for the month. It was $16 million, <laughs> over $16 million. Oh, they made an incredible amount of money um, this month. And um, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but, you know, it's just kind of, you have to wonder when we're going to kind of, when that's going to start tapering off, you know, when those numbers are going to start falling off and maybe we won't see that type of spending. I mean, I think it's unique. I don't think it's going to remain a precedent, but it does reflect on either not only where the current community is with this game, but maybe where the gaming industry and new people are, that they have a little bit more faith in this project. Um, a lot of people I know who have been backers, some of them spent money, but a lot of them did a lot of melting. Yeah, and again, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that this Sunday on this show. But it is it does show that there's an influx of fresh cash that's still coming in to Star Citizen. So it will be very, very interesting to see what happens. Dark Knight, you said the magic word. Oh boy, Origin is about to erupt. Thank you for that, Dark Knight. Wow. There's somebody who knows what they're talking about. So we will find out about that hopefully next month. Don't start, GG. Hopefully <laughs> next month. We will find out. I, I promise if I roll my eyes harder, they're going to get stuck back there. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see what happens, right? We will see what happens. Okay, so that was IAE. Um, there was another piece of good news that happened this week. And that piece of good news was, and we had talked about this even before, that by the time uh, IAE came around, hopefully we'll be going right into Ivacati. And that's literally what happened. Uh, Eva Cotti ended up getting their drop into 3.12, 312, and they have already been inside of that. There have already been some <clears throat> hints to what we're looking forward to seeing with 312. Some people, some pictures have leaked out. Nothing crazy and nothing that we didn't know about. It was just pictures that confirmed what CIG had already uh, told us would be coming. Um, so, Gigi, if, if you would, I, if you've got it up on the screen, I'll scroll, and if you don't mind just kind of reading each of the items that we have, and I'll try my best to keep up, and then I'll just talk about them a little bit as we go through them. Um, so we can start off with locations, I think was the first category, so uh, could you read what that one is? Have you got it up still? Okay, I'm not hearing you. Did we lose you again? Okay, can we now I can hear you. Yes. Hi. <laughs> okay. The system, system planetary improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what does it say? Are in development. Mm -hmm. So, updating content, utilizing the latest tech and pipeline improvements. Okay, so they're twenty-two out of twenty-five, which is a good thing, considering mm -hmm. that this is supposed to be coming out in fourth quarter, three twelve, which means by the end of the year. Uh, you guys know that sometimes CGIG goes a little bit past their deadline. It becomes like the first or second week of the next <laughs> month. But the fact that they are at 22 out of 25 is not is not bad. And that means that there's a good possibility uh, that we could uh, see that item roll right on out. Let's go to the next category, which is that one. Oh, by the way, before I go any further... Don't forget, guys, this is an interactive talk show. If you guys want to talk to us about what we're talking about, you can jump into our Discord. And you can, you can jump into our Discord and join us. And, of course, any questions you may have about IAE, about the roadmap, or just something you want to share, please jump into our Discord. The link uh, is pops up. It just popped up a few seconds ago. And you can come talk to me and Gigi. I'm sorry, Gigi. Go ahead. What was the second No, it's one? fine. Okay. So the Stanton system scape, spacecaping, which we have 26 out of 35 tasks completed. And it is introducing scape, spacecaping elements to the Lagrange points in the Stanton system. Okay. Now, with this one, I have to say, I ended up seeing a couple pictures that were floated out there. And man, it looked amazing. This is the whole thing that they talked about with that cloud tech and the nebula stuff. And mm -hmm. I know, Gigi, you talked about how pretty everything was before. And, you know, 26 out of yeah. 35, that's still a little ways to go, you know, but they could still release it and continue to work on it. 
Um, yeah. But it is nice to know that they're past the halfway point on this and moving up on, you know, the very end of working on that particular one. So, yep, those those clouds, those nebulas, they're going to be awesome. How about the next one? Like oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. How about the next one? Space Station Refinery Deck. And this one I am actually super excited about myself. Like, mm -hmm. yes, come on, mm -hmm. give it to me. <laughs> But um, <laughs> it's 75 of 81 tasks completed. So we're still a little bit off. We're, we're a ways away, but I will wait patiently. Mm -hmm. We are implementing refineries into rest stops, which will be a really good idea. I, I'm a thousand percent for it. Like, mm -hmm. come on, let's, let's do the thing because I hate getting somewhere and realizing that the thing I'm trying to do isn't even available here and I need to go... <laughs> And that, I mean, it's fine for certain things. Like I'm okay with, you can only buy certain clothes at R Corp or you can only get certain, you know, ammo or guns at Grim Hex or Levski, whatever. I, I get that and I'm fine with that. But when I'm just trying to sell whatever I got on my prospector, man, don't make me fly around the world <laughs> <laughs> to find some place to get it done. Yep. Well, you know what I heard about this too with the refinery deck is that this is not like the cargo decks. You know, when they put those in, they just said, well, the cargo decks will be there, but, you know, you won't be able to have any gameplay. Yeah. But they, I think these are actually going to be functioning when we get them. So I know you oh, like doing man. mining. Yes. So, yes. you know, it'll be really cool to see this come into the game and people who are into that whole mining career can kind of, you know, kind of jump in and start benefiting from what's there. Okay, so that was the first category. Oh. Let's go to that next one. Boom. I can get it squared on the screen for our fun, wonderful fans to see it better. There we go. You can read that one for AI. AI intercepting torpedoes. So it'll be AI turrets have been given the ability to intercept incoming torpedoes. Yes. <laughs> okay. okay. Look, I don't, I don't fly ships. <laughs> That's not what I do. Like, I can fly them, but I don't just pick up and be like, hey, I'm going to be the pilot for this group full of nine people that need to get somewhere yeah. because we're probably not going to get where we're going. But I can shoot at stuff, okay? <laughs> I'm good at shooting at things. Mm -hmm. And giving me the opportunity to stop an incoming turret, I mean, an incoming torpedo with a turret. I mean, I'm, I'm a turret gunner. That's what I am. Laser operator, turret gunner, miner. Mm -hmm. GG. Person. Oh, and I can do a map. I can do maps, navigation. But you know, just that would that sounds so cool. Just to be sitting in a turret, like, oh, incoming torpedo. I'm gonna see if I can take it out. You know what I mean? Like that just sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. I want to do that so bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, let me give you the other side of the coin to that. That's also that the AI is gonna be doing that. That are enemies as well. So it's gonna be both. Sides. I mean, I know, but <laughs> I get it. But I mean, I know. That's part of the fun. Yeah. Like, I don't want to fight something that's not fighting true, me. True. I agree. I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> that's not fun. It's going to be I, interesting. I want it to be hard. I want it to be challenging. I want to have to put some effort into it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it gets boring really fast. That's true. That's true. All right. Let's check the next one. That one there. AI fire mode. AI fire mode usage and targeting priorities. And it's being polished, apparently. Yeah. Fire modes ensure that ship AI can charge weapons, use varying fire modes, and that turrets properly prioritize targeting. Mm. Now, that's kind of cool because this is basically them stepping up the AI, like you said, of our enemies. Now they're becoming much more intelligent. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that means that yeah. they're also going to become more challenging. And by the way, that one you just read and the previous one and this one, in fact, all these AI ones are in polishing. So that's a good sign, which means that they've completed them. They're just getting it ready for launch, which is awesome. How about this one? AI accuracy convergence. Mm -hmm. And it's also in the polishing phase. Mm -hmm. Ship and turret AI's accuracy, accuracy system now based on convergence. Okay. So this was something that we used to have to deal with in E was convergence. There's this, you know, for those of you who don't know what convergence is, it's if, and please correct me if I'm wrong. It's basically the calculation of saying the speed of ships and how they are moving uh, when they're traveling. 
and how when you want to lock on to them that there's the adjustment that compensates for speed and angle of attack and all this other good stuff. So basically the AI are getting smarter and smarter and smarter. This last one, I'm not sure if it's going to fit in the screen. It doesn't. I can just put the picture in. So Gigi, could you read that one for Capital? Capital ship combat behavior improvements. Improved AI behavior for capital ship pilots. Okay. And so you guys oh, are... Okay, so then... Mm -hmm. those Yes. Go ahead. What are you going to say? Go ahead. <laughs> those, those, those giant uh, capital ship pilots mm -hmm. are going to be able to uh, to hit you better. <laughs> yep. That's the old Idris that we know is coming. So those of you who've been wanting yeah. to do all of the griefing and stuff, you guys know that that Idris is supposed to be out there to police the system of uh, Stanton. So, uh, yeah, that'll be something else we yeah, have to look yeah. forward to. Okay. Let's jump to that next one. Gameplay. There's a lot of categories in this one that we can cover. So let's hit this one here first one with reputation there and by the way you guys can join us in the conversation please feel free to click on the link and join us in our chat please please do we would love to talk to you reputation is that v1 or six i don't know what they're trying to say uh v1 yes version one okay Okay, reputation version one, reputation.org service. So we've got, we're almost done. 36 out of 37 tasks here. Mm -hmm. It's in development, but it's almost done. So it's introducing the first iteration of reputation, mm -hmm. which I am personally excited for. Um, because it was kind of like, remember back when we had the Femme Fatale show mm -hmm. and me and the girls were talking about loving to do in video game all the things that are morally repugnant in life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I don't actually feel that way about Star Citizen. I, when I'm in Star Citizen, I feel like a citizen of a city. I mm -hmm. feel like I am in a space where I want to be abiding by the law. If mm -hmm. that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So, I'm just. I'm kind of excited because this is the first time in a very long time that I've had any interest in like going the noble route. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really, you know, hoping to like work on reputation and work on my reputation as a miner and work on my reputation as a laser operator and as a turret gunner and just, you know, get myself up there and be one of the better players. Yeah. You know, one of the things most games have done with repu reputation, I mean, there is a form of reputation in a lot of MMOs, uh, I think for right now, the biggest aspect of reputation we've had to deal with is the crime, you know, the law system, the crime stats, right? Either yeah. good or bad based on that. But like you said, for them to be able to move reputation into other categories, I know Colossal was talking about one of the reasons why he was thinking about the Genesis Starliner, Starliner was that you gain a certain amount of UEE reputation based upon delivering people safely and on time places. So there's reputation in relation to your gameplay, uh, the reputation yeah. on a Genesis Starliner, your reputation is <clears throat> something as simple as whether or not your people are serve food and, and drink and they're happy when they get off your ship. Uh, reputation may be involved into like like you said delivery times. If you have a, if you're doing cargo, and then do you that's deliver like it? Mm, getting better missions because your reputation has gone up. You know exactly. what I mean? Like introducing mission play where you get better missions because you have a better reputation because you now have the experience. We feel like you know this company is looking into you and is willing to pay you way more than you would normally mm -hmm. get, but they know that you can do this because your rep is high. Mm -hmm. I'm so into that. Yeah. Yeah. Or the missions that you can't get, you know, because your reputation is kind of, yeah. you know, you're your more of a scoundrel. Right <laughs> yeah, and you can't get into it. We did, I remember at one point, uh, this is an earlier part of development when they were just trying testing some stuff. It's not this way now, but there was a point where if you had a crime stat at any level, if you died, you woke up in Grim Hex. <clears throat> and I mean, it's still kind of like that way now with the prison system, they've kind of moved it into that. But, and, and it was it was to such a degree that hey ryan oculars thank you for the follow we appreciate that um it was such to such a degree that and it was really cool because what they did was is that if you're a criminal you could look on your map and find grim hex and if you're a criminal you yeah. couldn't find port o 
<laughs> and then if you're a good person, you could find port O, but you couldn't. Find, you had to you had to like navigate to Grim Hex. It wasn't it wouldn't yeah, show up on your map. Yeah. 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 So I mean that was kind of a really like low end kind of thing of saying what what is the impact of if you play a certain way, but to see that they're going to put reputation yeah. into economics and all these other things. I think it's going to be really, really cool. Yeah. Let me jump to the next one here because I don't want to burn too much time on this one. How about that yeah, yeah. one? Landing services update, ordinance, replenishment. Mm -hmm. Four out of six tasks completed, so it's not that far off. We're, we're looking at some something close to the end of this one. It's in development, and it's missiles, countermeasures, countermeasures and flares are now being processed and replaced through the shopping system service. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, this is going to be kind of cool. I love that picture because that's the picture of the interior of the A2, which I upgraded to during the IAE. Thank you very much. Um, yes, the big, yes, the big exactly. Moab, the mother of all bombs there. But uh, this is important. Oh. And this is going to kind of really, I think some people will like this. And then some other people are going to get kind of a little perturbed. And what they're going to start implementing now is definite price changes or variances of prices depending on the type of weapons and ammunition that you're buying. So a level five, a class five, this or level five torpedo of this may go for one price, a level four, this price, or yeah. even different types of level fives may be at different prices. So people are going to have to start paying attention to the economics of the game and what they can afford to buy. Uh, they've been kind of real generous with us being able to get things because we're testing, but they're also going to now start. This is a sign that they're moving toward testing economics. And that's yes. something that we're all really, 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 Very really excited, really about. excited <laughs> about. Absolutely, absolutely. Very excited about. Okay, this is another one for you that affects in fact, you. Go ahead with that one. Mining UI Refractor, and it is in the polishing stage. And it's updating and implementing mining UI into the building block system. Okay. And a few weeks ago, they showed us this. The UI in the prospector is going to change dramatically. Uh, and the mole, uh, there's going to be way more information yeah. in the display now for miners, yeah. and it'll be everything from br the building blocks thing will allow you to now say, let's say you're mining a bunch of different materials, GG. Now you'll be able to look on your screen and actually see what percentage of materials you have in your cargo bay versus before, which is kind of like your cargo 70% full, yeah. boom, and that was it. 70% mm -hmm. full, this much of it is in there. Exactly. And that's all you really got. Exactly. There's also going to be much more information in relation to if you're um, mining quantanium, being able to release it if necessary, if it becomes too unstable. There's a whole lot and of other cool things that like, you put in. I don't know, see how fast we're going while we're mining? That's nice. <laughs> just, just a little bit, right? <laughs> All right, how about this Slightly one? would be in a while I'm scanning because it's horrifying to have no frame of reference at mm. all while I'm scanning. Yes, they're gonna the, put, the compass is just... going to be in. Yep, they're putting compass in. So <laughs> yep, absolutely. Okay, how about this one? Countermeasures version 1.1. .1. It's in the packaging stage, and it's improvements that give the player more control over deploying countermeasures and making the amount fired meaningful. Okay, so you combat folks. Which I feel, go ahead, go ahead. I feel like that's great. If you are going to put things in the game where now we're getting to the point torpedoes cost real money, and you know, like you need to kind of think about what you're buying and when you're buying it and why as far as munitions and ordnance is concerned. If that is the case, then absolutely make it where when I'm using it, mm -hmm. I'm not wasting it. Mm -hmm. Yep. I agree. And for the countermeasures, for those and of you who are, are combat people, this whole thing with chaff and flares and all that good stuff, you guys saw that a few weeks ago. They gave us examples of the new graphics for that. Um, yeah. Just be ready that this stuff is going to start working. And it's been kind of borked. Sometimes it works GG and sometimes it doesn't for people who are into the whole PvP combat stuff. But hopefully with this going to version 1.1, the new improved version, hopefully it will be a little bit better. All right. This is all a lot of good combat stuff. How about this next one here for us? Torpedo attack, counterbalance, and behavior. It's in the polishing phase. And torpedoes far more deadly on impact but with increased vulnerability to ship defenses okay so, so you can fire but you gotta pull your own shields down to do it mm -hmm. and well here's the deal too they're the dam they're gonna do more damage but like you said earlier Gigi, you talked about mm -hmm. being able to target them and hit them 
they're going to be more vulnerable if mm-hmm. we're nailing them. So yeah. it, it, like you said, it's yeah. a little give and take, right? More powerful, yep. but at the same time, if somebody gets a good lock on them, they may actually destroy your torpedo before it gets delivered. Yep. So, yep, that'll be good for those people with the big ships. I'm sure they'll be excited about that. All right, how about this next one? This one's a little bit different. This is more about visual effects. Capital ships, turrets, and torpedoes, VFX, SFX improvements. Mm -hmm. So video effects and sound effects improvements to turrets, torpedoes, and capital ship damage, and death masks, and it's in the polishing phase. All right, you pretty much said what it is. That means we're going to get a better sounding, better looking effect when it comes down to uh, those torpedoes and, and firing. All right, how about the next one? Vehicle entry identification, it's in the polishing phase, and adding visual hints as to where vehicles can be entered when in proximity, which, yes, look, Star (laughs) Citizen, I love you, but some of these ships are the size of small cities, okay? So we don't always know exactly what's what on them. If you could just... Show where's the, the button where's the door. The, the, the door at right where's the button where's the door where's right? the <laughs> door i don't want to have to be a foot and a half off the door to find it do you realize how infuriating that is when the ship's two football fields long <laughs> well i'll tell you a funny story i didn't know for a very long time and this is on the reclaimer I was used to coming into the back ramp, right? You know, that big that big loading dock that comes down. I would get on that, and that's how I used to get in the ship. I didn't know that there was a pilot entrance at the front of the ship. Oh, yeah. And so I went up there trying to figure out where is it at, where is it at? And I didn't realize that if you just stand near it, there's a light, there's like a beam mm. that flashes. And then if you just face it, it'll say, you know, click on it. And I didn't know that. So I'm like looking up in the sky up on, you know, like on the ship, like, where do I click on this thing to, to come down? <laughs> that went on for like months. I hate to admit that before it dawned on me that that I thought the light was just saying, come here. I didn't know that it was literally right in front of me. So the fact that they're going to, like you said, they're going to make it better because some ships like I know on the Carrick before it was a matter of you just clicked on the door, then they put the button in. A lot of people didn't know they put the button at the back of the door. So yeah. the, and the fact that this is going to be for vehicles and they, they're showing a picture here of a Merlin. And I think what they're also hinting to is that for ships like the Connie's that have the bringing vehicles in like that snub ship, that you'll also have something that indicates how to line up when you want to lock in as well. So I think it's going to be a combination of all those cool things. Um, boom. Here's another one that you're going to like. How about that one? Station-based refining, and we have 70 of 72 tasks done, so we are pretty close to it. Kimmy, don't. I hate splines. No splines. Down with splines forever and always. (laughs) Sorry, guys. But station-based kiosks that allow players to refine raw materials, raw mixed materials into pure elements. Okay. So these are going to be station-based, huh? Uh Uh-huh. Well, you know, I mean, the, the refining, I'm assuming... Because the ref- yeah. there are refineries so at some stations. At some stations. Mm-hmm. Right. At some. Right. I don't know that all of them will have them, but some will. So we'll just have to, when we get in there and look at the maps, we'll find out what, what has what. Okay. And then here's one that's really been popular that people are really excited about. In fact, we're going to kind of talk about this a little bit. Grand multi-tool tractor beam attachment. It's 21 of 24 tasks completed and it's in development. The creation of new multi-tool attachment and first implementation of the multi-tool tractor beam. Okay. And we're going to see a little bit of that in ISC, so we won't even talk about it, but I'm sure we'll talk about it when we watch the ISC. Here's another one for gameplay. Just we have one more after this one. How about that one? Weapon zeroing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's in the polishing stage. The first implementation of weapon zeroing. Okay, so for those of you who got scopes and those, especially those who are snipers, you want to become even more accurate, boom. We already knew this was coming. They've been telling us it's on its way, so it brings another element of gameplay. DG, I can't get that last picture up, but go ahead and tell them what that one is. Everybody's been looking forward to this one. Elevator panel updates. Woo! Yes! There you go. <laughs> uh, 18 tasks completed. It's in development and utilitarian elevator panel updates. Okay. So no more of that, uh, all the different levels on the panel when, <laughs> when you go up to it to push a button, okay? All right, let's go to ships and vehicles. What do we got coming?
the Asperia Talon, mm -hmm. just 43 of 54 tasks completed. So I'm not saying look for her too soon. <laughs> mm, that's, a, that's a good you point. Know? I, I can't get the other screen to come up, but it's both the Talon and the Shrike. You guys and know the, the Shrike, right. Tal Talon's the fighter. The Shrike is the missile boat. Um, unfortunately, GG, they didn't have those on the floor at IAE. And I was kind of yeah. hoping that at least the exterior would have been there so that, you know, people could see it since we know it was coming out in 312. But, um, hey, you know, we know that it is coming. And like you said, it might be one of those 3.1 to 0.1 releases versus uh coming out right with 3.12 yeah and then i think the last items these may not reach the screen either but we can read them what's that first one we have the bearing f fs9 lmg mm -hmm. it is in the polishing phase and it is creation and implementation of the new F fps weapon so mm -hmm. you know first right. person shooters for y'all who like star marine this is going to be the gun for you. <laughs> and then we've got one more, which will not go on the screen. And that one is the Gemini A03 sniper rifle. It's another sniper rifle. You know, I kind of get this feeling that there's going to be this sniper thing is going to be, I think it's going to be pretty big. Cause I'm noticing that there's not like just one or two sniper rifles. I think this is probably like maybe the fourth, well, the fifth or sixth sniper rifle that they're putting into the game. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be kind of interesting to see where people kind of go with this whole thing with sniping. The Gemini a03 sniper rifle mm -hmm. okie dokie okie dokie all right guys so that's the roadmap so you guys see you know a month ago you know a couple months ago people thought that 312 was kind of empty didn't have a lot of things in it but gg you read off a whole lot of stuff today and so it's giving us a lot of things to look forward to uh, again those of us who are into the mining thing of course we're really going to be happy with what pops up there um, so, hey, we're going to invite you guys to come in again. Uh, you guys can join us in the chat. We're going to take a look at ISC. I'm sorry. Yeah. Inside Star, yeah, Inside Star Citizen for this week, which was on yesterday. It was broken into two parts. We're going to watch the first part, take a break, watch the second part. Again, if you guys want to come in and talk with us about it, you are, of course, welcome to do so. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So this ship is really a military ship. It's about destroying other big ships. Because it's so formidable that you're in a fight and if somebody turns up with a fleet and it's stacked full of gunships, you're just gonna be like, oh damn. A fleet in Star Citizen is sort of built around a, a capital ship or capital ships as its core. So you have the Javelin, which is a destroyer. So that is designed for really duking it out with other big capital ships. You have the Idris, which is a carrier, so can sort of take on other big ships. It's got a big railgun on the front, but primarily it's there to deliver fighters. And then you have the Polaris, which is a long range torpedo boat. And you have the Hammerhead, which is a great anti-fighter screen. But what we're missing is this hybrid role that sits between the Hammerhead and the Polaris. That is your fleet defense ship that is moderately large size and capable of dishing out firepower to, to deal with large ship threats that aren't quite capital ships. It has been a while since we've uh, done an RSI ship. Obviously there are some in the fleet already and then you take all those and you fold in the functionality. When we were designing this ship it was obviously built around the, the concept of having these large turrets that you had a bridge on the front but it, it sort of just felt like a, a Polaris with a turret on the top and the bottom and for a ship of this style having that bridge at the front didn't quite sit well with us so we then tried alternates with a more traditional bridge taking cues from the the bengal and that that definitely looked better but then has the the knock on that the upper front turret has a blind spot behind so we had to make sure that the rear turret could not have a blind spot there and then deal with the point defense system turrets to help alleviate those spots you want it to look aggressive but you also want it to be unique you want it to look like it's part of the family. When you see this ship, you know you're in trouble. That's what players are looking for. So originally the brief for the ship was a real skeleton crew of four men. Uh, so you had the pilot, the captain, and the two turret gunners. But as we developed the ship, it sort of felt a bit odd that such a small crew was operating such a, a relatively large ship. 
So the crew size for the ship is six man. That gives you a pilot, captain, two manned turret guns because the S7 twin turrets are manned. And then it leaves you with these two extra roles that are really flexible in terms of what you want them to do. So we wanted to layer in all the functionality that John wanted, but also make it easy to navigate. It should be clear for the player at any point what part of the ship they're in. And it's split over three decks. So the lower deck is your cargo and access to the lower turret. And then you go up and then that's sort of the main deck. And that goes from front to back. You know, you can reach your front turret torpedo room or you can go right back into habitation and the captain's room and there's also a central lift for ease of navigation basically and then the top floor is bridge escape pods and engineering section so for a player it should all be quite uh, straightforward i think the ship really will add something to the the fleet gameplay that is growing within star citizen We've already seen aspects of that with the Invictus launch week. Uh, you've seen the capital ships in game. There's obviously the Hammerhead in game already. When this is in game, you'll also have much more of a rounded fleet to play with that will provide a great threat and deterrence to, to other players. The RSI Perseus is the latest concept offering available now on the robertspaceindustries.com website. And if you'd like to learn more, there's also a thread on Spectrum collecting questions ahead of a Q&A comm link that's coming in the next few days. Okay. So, Gigi, did you buy a Perseus? <laughs> <laughs> I, guess that's, I guess that's a no. Is it a hard no? That's the hardest no. <laughs> okay. Well, uh... I didn't either. Um, to, to, well, you know what? Up to be honest with you, when I saw it, I mean, we we knew this ship was coming. We knew something like this was coming. We didn't know exactly what, but we knew something like this was coming. And I was a bit surprised at how many people were ready to buy it. I was uh, in uh, chat that morning. I think it was Saturday morning, and it was an hour before the sale. Uh, I was in with a bunch of people from Test Squadron. There was probably like maybe around 20 people in chat. And all of them were, well, not all of them. I'd say 70% of them were preparing for the top of the hour where they would buy this ship. And yeah. I was totally blown away. I mean, 600 bucks. Um, but, but, and they were ready to buy it. And they did. Yeah. You know, many of them did. I was just... Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I had a, I have a friend who bought one. Mm -hmm. I'm just, you know, uh, no, but <laughs> mm -hmm. I have a friend who bought one and I feel like you said it earlier. A lot of people were melting stuff more than they were just forking over $600, right? Mm -hmm. So specifically, if we're talking about Test Squadron, mm -hmm. most of those people have so many ships True. that they're not flying or that they don't have the opportunity to fly because right now it's still in concept. Mm -hmm. So if you're just melting your concept ships and getting something you want right now with the intent that you can always, it's in buybacks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you can True. always go back for that bigger ship that you want mm -hmm. when it comes in and work for the smaller ones. But for right now, why not? No, and true. if you want a Perseus, absolutely. Th that was the time to do it. Yeah. Well, to your point, I will admit there were several of them that were there because they were melting and trying to get ready, <laughs> get ready for the sale. Uh, but here's the here's the hook. Saturday's sale was the biggest ship sale in CIG's history. They yeah. sold two point five million dollars on the Perseus. And I guess what spooked me about it was it's just not the ship that I would have thought would generate that level of buying you know what i mean you know um, what i think happened really mm -hmm. and i'm really honest here i don't think like i do think people really wanted the perseus and they were like yes you know i'm gonna go get it but mm -hmm. i think more of it was they are starved for star citizen right now mm -hmm. you know what i mean like and on top of that they've got cash on hand because they were supposed to be at Sitcon oh, and they didn't go. Yeah, so they yeah. have this leftover money mm. that they were going to spend and they're like, well, I'll hang on to it for IAE. Mm -hmm. And true. I think that on top of just really being starved for 
for the game, because they're not getting so much because we're all locked down, mm -hmm. might have fueled that more than anything else. That's a good point, because there are people who tell me all the time how much they, they save for CitizenCon. You know, they literally spend the year yeah. preparing for the trip yeah. itself. And even though even they go trip, they'll spend money to buy stuff. But now they had not only their ship money, but yeah. now they've got trip money that they didn't necessarily, mm -hmm. like you said, that they didn't necessarily have to spend. So you might that you might be onto something with that. I agree. Okay, well, that's that. Let's hit number two here, the second half of this here with the good old disco. But up next, let's look at a small feature looking to make a big impact with the new tractor beam attachment coming online in the upcoming Alpha 3.12. So the desire was to get tractor beams into Star Citizen. It's a sandbox game. We want something that can manipulate physics-enabled objects. You don't always want to carry everything with your hands. The best kind of like test ground for us was to start small and with the multi-tool. Nice. This was an attachment that we wanted to add for a while now. This attachment essentially is kind of graded to lift smaller objects, so cargo crates and such. You're able to lift them up, you're able to move them closer, you're able to move them further away. You can rotate them if you want to, to place them, you know, accurately inside your ship or otherwise. You can use them in gravity. Obviously, the higher the gravitational environment you're in, the heavier the object becomes and the more the multi-tool might struggle. That will make running. At the moment, we're tuning it, but it's great to lift cargo it box so much kilograms. easier. So most of the cargo crates well, Even if you're just it's doing a box mission or even stuff like that, exactly. Like if you're out in the middle of space, man, One of the things that we're still EVP. tuning <laughs> is essentially the acceleration and the lag of the object that you've actually got tethered to your multi-tool. So if you pick up a soda can or whatever, something that's really, really light, you will have that more rigid beam because the beam's not struggling to pick up something so light. But if you pick up a really heavy crate that's like full of metals or something, you will start to see that lag and the beam will be more likely to bend and break. At the moment, what we've got right now is work in progress, but we're working on that right now to make it feel right. Everything we show on ISC is work in progress. Jared made me say that. <laughs> <laughs> there is a second function to it too, so if you start targeting large and, uh, you know, massive objects like ships uh, that you wouldn't necessarily be able to pull with this thing because it's so small, its secondary use is more like a grapple hook almost. You essentially start pulling yourselves towards these massive objects in zero-g faster than your EVA pack should be able to take you. It's the Spider-Man tool. <laughs> So ultimately, this is a sandbox tool. It's something that can manipulate any physics-enabled object in the game, or at least interact with it in some way. Really looking forward to see how people put this to use, because uh, there's so many ways in which you can utilize it. There are some crazy things that we've seen internally at the moment, which sadly, some of those things we can't allow to go out because, you know, it's going to break the game. But also there are some fun things that we've decided are okay to leave in there. So really, I'm very excited to see the videos coming out online of people using this thing. And I can't wait to see it in people's hands. So what did we learn this week? Well, we learned that between its menacing silhouette and massive turrets, the Perseus is meant to intimidate. That the new tractor beam attachment for multi-tools is going to open up an entire universe of traversal possibilities when it arrives in Alpha 3.12 and that the new fleece blanket that's currently available on the RSI website is more than just a super comfortable blanket, it also makes a pretty nifty backdrop if you live somewhere where it doesn't get very cold. For Inside Star Citizen, I'm Jared Huckabee. We'll see you next week. Okay, so, GG, what'd you think of that uh, new attachment for the multi-tool? I'm into the tractor beam. I am. I am into the tractor beam. And what were you saying? Um, you were saying something about being able to use it in space and it'd be easier or something you were saying earlier? I was saying that it would be easier if you are flying around out in the middle of space, mm -hmm. trying to hold on to a cargo box and mm -hmm. what you're trying to do. You know what I mean? Like, that's not where you, <laughs> yeah, cargo box in, in the hands. No. Mm -hmm. So being able to kind of track their beam and, and then having a friend on the ship where you can just kind of throw it to them and assembly line these things will make a big difference be, between in speed. You know, there's a huge difference in assembly line when I can toss it to you and trust that you're going to catch it 
or do I have to walk it over to you, place it in your hands and walk back to my space? Mm -hmm. You know, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think you can definitely see the possibilities of what they've set up with that tool being there. Um, I'm just kind of curious to see right now the multi-tool when you use it, it it's it has that ever ready ever charged duracell battery that never runs out <laughs> and i'm curious to whether or not they'll implement something later where you know it has like a power cell or something so that you know it will run out i mean don't get me wrong if they want to keep it that way that's fine i'm just kind of curious to see whether or not it's going to maintain uh that it doesn't run down because it's it, then it becomes like this tool that just is always there but i don't know i don't want to give see any ig any ideas in that direction right um so anyway yeah i thought that was cool what did you think about that whole thing of the music like a grappling hook where it was able to pull you what did I'll you think pull about you that? along mm -hmm. i think that pirates are going to love that mm -hmm. okay i'm i'm looking at what are going to be some of the I other applications go ahead mm -hmm. I, I think pirates being able to like sneak around the lower levels of your ship or being able to kind of latch on to the outside of your ship if you're in atmosphere. Yeah, that's what I really can see. It. Yeah, I could definitely see when you're trying to come up to a ship. That's definitely something yeah. I could use. But, but, but then again, anybody could, right? Even if you're doing repairs to your ship, you can see it. Yeah. Um, obviously, yeah, he exactly. said there were some things that they weren't going to do because they're game breakers. Something tells me that means that you won't be able to latch it onto a person. <laughs> you know, and snatch yeah. them, which is probably a good thing. Around, yeah, you, which, you, which yeah. Good idea. yeah, we don't need to have that. But they, but they did see them move a big Benny's machine, different size boxes, different size storage pieces. So, uh, yeah, it's going to be pretty neat to see where that goes. Okay, well, those are two great items in that ISC for this week. And uh, th this week we're going to look at the uh, SCL guys, the Star Citizen Live. Uh, Jarrett uh, spoke with uh, some of the guys from CIG about the IAE. But they do share some information about things that are coming up that they're working on. So I definitely want to tell you, uh, if, if get something to drink, get something to snack on. This is an hour-long piece, as you guys know most SCLs are. I told Gigi to get ready to crochet while she's listening because there's a lot here. But we will stop and talk about a couple things. There's some information in here about the 600i. So you know I'm going to stop and talk about that. Okay. <laughs> just so you'll know but uh they are going to talk about some other things too so let's jump back into that and get started with the scl for this week hi everybody welcome to another episode of star citizen live this time our post iae free fly all ships q a i'm your host jared huckabee and if you've never seen star citizen live before it's where we take about an hour out of our day at the end of our week and we look into star citizens development live uh sometimes we we explore the process of creating a thing with our developers sometimes we put our team members to the hot seat and make them answer questions directly uh from you the star citizens and that's what we are doing today so we're going to jump right into it our guest for our post iae free fly uh all ships q a are two uh two uh, vehicle uh, directors uh or two directors related to the vehicle ishness we'll start with john crew john crew tell us who you are and what you do for star citizen uh hi i'm john crew i'm the vehicle ish director vehicle -ish uh, so i look after all the vehicle teams all right and uh, uh ben uh this is you've been on star Citizen live once before uh, uh back when you were the the, the the props art director but you're joining us here today who are you and what do you do for star citizen yeah so i'm the other vehicle director but the art one um ben curtis uh i am the well yeah the vehicle art director uh, i also run props and weapons um but vehicles are my my new thing no oh we say new you've, you've been in this role for a couple months now right yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I've am i just passed my six years at CIG, so I've been here for a while. Um, but it's about six months ago um, that, that I took over vehicles. I know. Yeah, help, and, helping John out. And then uh, for those of you who watched a long time, we still have Paul Jones. Paul Jones is still one of the Star Citizens Art Directors. Uh, the division of labor there, as far as ships go, is, is Paul works on the concept side, and then you work on the implementation and building. Yeah, and yeah. So, 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 like, a lot of the time, you know, like, Paul works with the concept to kind of get that initial vision going um, and then once that's kind of you know everyone's happy with that that then comes to um, myself and to John and, and to you know the art and design teams and all the other teams to actually take that that concept and deliver it into game for people to play with okay 
So today we, uh, we, we are talking ships. Now, we have a lot of starships. Starships. Star Trek, don't sue me. A lot of spaceships in, uh, in Star Citizen, well over 150 some odd at this point. I should have counted beforehand. Uh, for this, for today's show, we are, we are focusing almost primarily on the flyable ships uh, since we just had our IAE uh, free fly. We will dive into some general, uh, general ship related questions. We will dive a little bit into some ships that haven't quite made it flyable yet. But as far as where our focuses, focuses are, it's on the ships that are currently flyable and the stuff that is in development now. Um, for those who have questions about the Perseus, uh, which is the most recently revealed uh, Star Citizen concept ship. There is a specific Q&A being put together for that. Uh, so we will be doing no Perseus-related questions today because there's already a whole other thing dedicated to that. And we want to save our time for everything else here. So uh, our categories today, we, we, got, we got questions for flight-ready uh, flight ships. We got questions for general ship-related aspects, the things that uh, kind of apply to all ships. We've got questions uh, about the future of stuff and then general process stuff. So we're going to start in and jump right into our uh, flight-ready ship questions. If you're watching live, you can submit your questions with the word question in capital letters surrounded by brackets and we'll pull those out and we'll start adding those in again of course provided that they uh, apply to the co topic of the conversation and uh, I do want to say right off the bat no one questions uh, if, this, this, if this is your first Star Citizen live broadcast or your 50th uh, you know we don't address one questions we have an entire roadmap dedicated to that at robertspaceindustries.com slash roadmap where all one related stuff is uh address there. So right off the bat, uh, with two of the most recent flight, re flight ready ships, uh, if the Mercury and Nomad's fuel consumption is intended, as some folks have heard uh, th through Spectrum, what I, why are they so much higher than other ships in a similar class? And if, th and if that's how it's supposed to be, will other ships be rebalanced up to this uh, 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 seemingly new standard? Uh short answer is that that was not intended that was uh more harsh on the fuel than we had anticipated so um that's been fixed for 312 so they're back to a, a, a norm what what should have been the norm for their release and it sort of spurred some further discussions for uh future star systems because at the moment, all the fuel is balanced around what's in Stanton to give the best gameplay there. But when we go to other systems, such as Pyro, there is significantly less opportunity to refuel. So we're, we're having discussions right now, uh, people like Todd and Tony, to go over, right, what's what's the, the range time that we're going to support here? And then we'll be balancing the ships around that so it works in a multi-system behavior rather than just contained to the standard system so everything that we have at the moment is sort of designed for what's in the game right now but we want to move to a more future-proof system where ships can go for i uh, the the nomad and star runner were particularly wrong but the the idea is not to be like you've only got 40 minutes of fuel so make your best of it we're talking like an hour two three four is your default range uh, before you need to start considering fuel uh refueling okay all right, just real quick on that, guys um, and gang. Um, I thought that was really cool to kind of know. Not not about this thing about the fuel consumption, but what he talked about the fact that they have things balanced right now for Stanton, just for one system. And I think sometimes people don't think about that. They forget about it. They think that this is balancing for the verse, which it isn't. But as the verse comes online, then obviously they will compensate for that. So as he just mentioned, going from 40 minutes of fuel to an hour and a half worth of fuel. But then he happens to mention where some systems like Pyro won't have so many opportunities. There won't be all of these rest and rehabs throughout Pyro where you can stop and get fuel. So you're going to have to really be thinking about when you're traveling from one location to another. What does that mean? So just something to think about on that. Gigi, do you want to say anything about that? Or you want me to keep rolling? No, go ahead. Okay. Um... I, Wait, I, I would like to that, say so we'll real quick, y'all come <laughs> to the Discord chat, talk with us about We'd love to have you in and chat. Yep, if you guys want to join us, we're here. Come on in, there's the link. There. Um, what else do we got? The Starfarer. 
currently has no component housings and has long been, I'm not sure that's right, and has long been looked at as the ship needing some work by the community. Is it going to, is it, is it going to get a pass to add component housing or will there be some kind of additional interior overhaul at a later date? Uh, there, it does have some. I, I'm pretty sure it has some in there. They may not be like component housing, like the, the more modern ships, but there are certainly spaces for them in. Uh, I, I don't want to say the, the Star Trek phrase, but the, the certain tubes uh, along the edge, there are there are hollowings there. Uh, there is definitely space for the power plant in the engineering room. So yeah, th I, there are spaces. The, the, I know there is definitely space in the ship for it. I think, you know, eventually all our ships are going to need the, these component housings be accessible and, and be available um, so we definitely will be kind of going back and, and giving it a revisit um, you know and what what we tend to do with a lot of the ship stuff anyway is um, as you know new features come online we're going to need to retrofit that stuff to a lot of the existing ships um, so I think um, the, the component layout is something that we take into consideration right at the start of a concept of a ship and we make sure that there is space for it because uh, you know, I've Again, a lot of this is, is before my time, but I know um, we have had this kind of issues where, especially with the smaller ships, it becomes quite difficult to fit some of these um, components into because new features are you know, ever evolving and ever being developed. That it's only when you know when you kind of have that feature working that you appreciate um, what what needs to be done to kind of deliver that to the player. Um, but yeah, we will be going back and revisit, going back and adding dashboard buttons and you know, player storage and, and everything else that that is currently required and I expect lots of future new fun things as well. Yeah, we, we don't want ships that came out a few years ago to be a disadvantage to the more modern ones when, when the dust is set up. They, they all need to perform the, the same gameplay functions. Yeah. Um, it's uh, w w We have a question uh, related to this later on, so we'll get into more about the topic of you know, keeping these ships up to date and, you know, making sure the old ones match up to the quality of the new ones. Um, continuing on with the flight ready stuff here, um, there is a significant amount of empty space on the starboard bow of the Mercury Star Runner. Uh, why is that? And do we have plans for it in the future? Um, I mean, I think, you know, th there's always a, a balance between kind of visually what you want the ship to look like and functionally what it, it needs to to work um i think um there's you know when it comes to kind of making the exteriors and interiors work together you know if you've got um a, a big vent or a big access hatch or something on the exterior of the ship and and on the inside there's a room that it goes straight into it just it doesn't make sense and there's kind of a bit of a balance between um like making the player space and, and the functionality work and then the kind of implied functionality of what the exterior of the ship is kind of telling you and how those two things kind of work together um on the the star runner itself um oh, I, I remember actually having a look at this when we were kind of playing with with the ship and, and kind of when it was in development um and although there does look to be quite a large kind of dead space at the front of it by the time you take into account all of the player metrics and the size we need to actually um fit additional rooms in there it does start to get a little bit tight with a lot of intersection kind of in in the exterior um and also you know when you take into account things like uh the kind of like the, the safe space we need between the interior and exterior for damage meshes and for our vis areas and, and all those sort of like more technical things that i'm rapidly learning about um <laughs> there's you know it's, it's not sometimes as easy like oh, can we not just move this room back a few meters and get a bit more space um and i think there's also that kind of balance between having um having dead space in ships so ships that have got big open spaces in them and how that feels as a player when you're when you're in it because you know for, for me I, I like i like functionality i like that kind of that that feel that uh you know you can go through a room and know that there is functionality um in there and i think yeah we could we could fit some more you know cool spaces in there but you'd have like a little rat rat maze going around and, and it's like well, where, where they then lead you to and so yes there is some empty space in there um could we have made it better we probably could have done but i'm, I'm very happy with what we did i think it's cool i think i think most people are very happy with uh, the mercury star runner it's you know it's been a fan favorite ship since it was first introduced and um you know and, and i know there were a lot of 
uh, we, we did the thing last week on ISC where I tried to even mention everybody that worked on the ship, and I still missed people. Uh, you know, it was, it's definitely a uh, what, what, what's the phrase? I think John said it. In the, it takes a village. It takes a village to to to, to make these things. And uh, uh, yeah, it, in the, the unique challenges of Star Citizen, of having to make sure that the interiors fit the exteriors one one. Uh, yeah, it's not something anybody else has. The interior of the Millennium Falcon does not fit in the exterior of the Millennium Falcon. But they can fudge it, and we can't. Uh, continuing on with the Mercury Star Runner questions, uh, is it possible that we may see a second exit added to the Mercury Star Runner in the future? Uh, the ship's kind of a major fire hazard at the moment. One way in or out. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, something that was probably a bit more of an oversight on our part than uh intentional um so we, yeah, we can I, certainly I, I watched the first few videos come out and was like how how did we miss this <laughs> not quite sure uh I, I don't know but um yeah yeah maybe that is a, a use case for some of the, the dead space but we'll see um i, I, I did enjoy the reddit trolling of yes uh, the person who added the, the the bottom hatch and people yeah. got excited and it was like no let's just read it <laughs> Um, talking about uh, uh, changes to ship interiors, the Origin 600i. Uh, there's been talk in the past about an update to its interior. Uh, do we have anything to share at this point? Uh, nothing super tangible, but I have had a designer go through it and come up with a proposal for how we want to uh, redo the interior. The exterior less so. The exterior is in a pretty good shape. Um, but the interior definitely suffers from uh, some weird traversal routes, uh, stuff like Ben mentioned uh, about just huge spaces, but they're, they're huge spaces that don't really do anything. Um, and then adding some functionality in that, that should have been there from the start, like a, a docking collar. So design wise, we're, we're doing the pass on that and then it will need to go to concept because it, it's, it's not as simple as, oh, just take, take a look at the 890 and just copy paste that in <laughs> job done uh, there there is some finessing that needs to go on there yeah. and yeah and i think that's it like um there, there's a space for big open ships like that's definitely a thing you know you take the 890 and, and you know that that that's has its has its functionality or has its purpose in in the verse so there is definitely a, a, a space for ships that that are roomy mm -hmm. um but that it's not you know one solution for every ship, every manufacturer. I think there's you know, enough that there, there should be plenty of variation. Uh, austerity has its limits. Okay, there it is, gang. You heard it. They've got a design plan that's on the table for the 600i. GG, you're not smiling. I, I don't know why you're not smiling at this point, but they have this <laughs> on the design table for the 600i. So uh, there's something to look forward to, Origin folks. So if you, for those of you who melted your 600, you better hold on to your pants because, uh, yeah, you might be wanting to buy that thing back a little bit later. But if you don't, that's fine. It can be more exclusive, and that would be even better. So <laughs> GG's not saying anything, y'all. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to keep going. <laughs> so um, I uh, got a number of questions about the uh, uh, the, the, the Carrick here, so let's just take them one at a time. Um, any update to the armored cockpit shutters? Uh, they're, they're still planned. They're not cut. Um, it's sort of tied in with some of the other the th other features of the Carrick that aren't there. Uh, it's a case of. Uh, we wanted to hit the deadline of releasing the ship. Uh, they they had no real function uh, at release, so we, we we made sure they would work, so we didn't have to come back and do unnecessary work for them. But uh, until they have a, a need that requires them, that we're we're not going to spend the time putting them in. Okay. Uh, the retractable antenna. Uh, same same answer, but that one can at least be quantified with jump points because they're for, they're for mapping jump points. So without jump points, then you can just raise an antenna up and down. <laughs> yeah, I, I was actually at the Max file recently and, and looking at it, I was like, oh, they're, they're in, they work. But you know, like, like John says, until that feature's in and, and with you know some of the other things we've already talked about, until, until that feature comes online, it's kind of redundant putting the, the taking it all the way to final when you're not 100% sure how that feature is going to work. And you don't want to just, you know, 
the most annoying thing is spending time getting something like looking just how you like it and then someone comes along and it's like oh actually yeah we need to change this now and you're like oh I just, just thought yeah. i had that done and exactly. yeah but, so it's it's a it's a time and resource thing as well like we could have a designer and an artist spend time doing that or we could have them fixing issues like people falling out of ships and things like that and i think i know which one most people would oh are you going to fix that? one fixed sorry <laughs> i said oh are you going to fix that uh, yeah um all right and then i'm going to assume it's the same answer for like the underside pods the yeah, still still planned. Um, they they are those ones are actually technically blocked, um, but that's the the same tech blocker as we have with the retaliator modules. So uh, when we have that, uh, retaliator modules will probably be the first thing that come online using it, and then we can go back through the the catalog of ships that have that same sort of modular room functionality and implement that. All right. Um, uh, let's see what else do we got as far as the flight ready ships go. Uh, uh, the defender. The defender had some. Uh, what were they? The tachyon weapons. The the, the hit scan weapons uh, for a while. Um, do we intend those to come back? Um, for the defender, probably not. Uh, they were a cool idea. They worked better on paper than they did in reality. Uh, they caused a lot more problems than they they solved. Um, not so much the actual weapons themselves, it's the fact that they were bolted onto a very maneuverable ship. Um, so we, we're still going to have tachyon weapons in the game, but they're almost certainly going to be more restricted to, to heavier heavier ships where having a hit scatter weapon is less uh, balance problematic. Hmm. Um, let's see. Uh, the Constellation line. Jeez, we're just... We're, we're, we're just hitting all the greatest hits here. I want to stop there real quick and ask a question to chat. You guys heard what they said about the Tachyon weapons on the Defender. They're going to evidently keep them off and they're going to change it to some other type of weapon and move Tachyons to larger ships. Do you think that that will... Do you think Defender owners will be upset? Or do you think they'll be patient and wait and see what CIG, CIG comes with? Hopefully that's comparable. Drop that in chat if you guys have got an opinion on that. And uh, don't forget you guys can join us in chat as well. Uh, the Constellation Line has been in a pretty rough spot for a couple of years now. Uh, what can you tell us about any plans to uh, bring them in line? Uh, a few things. So 312, it's had a fairly comprehensive uh, rebalance pass in terms of its handling because it was absolutely not handling where we wanted it to to handle um i know it's got some uh, much fabled uh shield holes on there that ultimately will get fixed by sdf shields and every ship that has these shield holes will get fixed by that as well um so in the interim we we have been fixing them up as we find them it's a it's a very weird um <laughs> it's it presents itself as a bug, but it's act the code is actually doing exactly what it's being told to do. Um, you're, you're hitting items attached to ships that aren't being registered by the shield because they're not the ship itself. So it sort of bypasses things. So we've been doing a few ways to sort of mitigate that. Um, and then I, I guess the big elephant is the room is the, the visuals of the thing. And much like the, the comments we gave earlier that we, we will be going back through these ships and bringing them up to date. So the Constellation does have component hatches in there, but they're not they're not necessarily the right size or the ideal placement. Uh, people will see some minor interior changes when uh, Constellation and Merlin docking comes online, um, just because we've had to go do some work to the to the rear of the ship. Um, yeah, I think, my, I think you know. Oh. Uh, the, sorry, the, the last thing on that is uh, I did say that when when the Taurus comes out, we we want to look at the the view because it is a bit strutty. Yeah, I mean, I think I think like you say, John. Yeah, you know, um, when when we go back and do that sort of work that we need to do to bring up all the, all the ships up to that kind of same level, um, when we when we go into the ships and open up the files, if there's if there's glaring issues, we always try and do that kind of like little bit of polish pass. But again, it comes down to what the um, 
I guess what the, the big focus is for that release and if it's okay actually we need to go through you know, a whole bunch of ships and get them all up to a similar standard functionality wise then we have less time to go in and take one through to you know give it a full refit I don't I don't you know we haven't got anything scheduled for a refit as far as I know at the moment unless John's gonna tell me otherwise no cool, cool. Um, <laughs> yeah uh you know so I think you know when we when, like I say when we go in we we kind of do a, a polish pass and a fixed pass but um apart from that nothing planned to my knowledge yeah uh, and I'll try not to repeat it about the resource and time thing um I would much rather work on new ships or ships that we've not we've promised and not delivered yet than rework a ship four times that someone's already got especially if it if it functions and it does its role i would much rather put the team's effort into delivering some of the the community favorites than and, and, yeah. we're, we're, that. It. we're gonna have a question here in a little bit that's specifically about how okay. we determine reworks and stuff like that so we'll, we'll just uh we'll, 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 we'll cover it there it's one of the most it's a it's a question whose answer applies to a lot of ships, so uh, let's hang tight on that for now. Uh, the Saber Raven is treated like a forgotten reject. Those are my words, not that. Those, those, those words. Uh, will it be fixed? Uh, I I am not, and I'm not going to proclaim I know every single bug for every vehicle in the game, but I'm not aware of it having any any major issues uh suddenly as of 312 there there were some fixes that were done to the saber that because the raven is essentially uh, it, it doesn't come out the same source files it comes out of a completely separate one so you have to sort of do the same fix twice to fix it that hadn't been carried over so we made sure those came over for for 312 um, so hopefully it's in a much better state but i'm not entirely sure what issues there are and if there are major issues then then please put it in the issue council and uh, the guys who monitor that for for the team will, yeah. will get that to us. Yeah. I, I, I just want to reiterate that just to make sure it's clear. There there had been several fixes and improvements made to the regular to the baseline Raven in previous patches that hadn't been carried over, or in the, to the regular Raven to the regular regular Saber. Jeez, that weren't carried over to the Raven because it's a different hull, and those fixes are now in three twelve. Yeah. Pretty and, and much think, the, the only items that are the same between the two are the seat and the dashboard. Yeah, Jim. Like, like visually, it's, 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 a, it's a really pretty ship. I really like it. It's one of, one of my favorites. So um, hopefully there's not a load of visual issues with it. If there is, again, let us know. And we'll um, uh, why does one of the Razor variants, they don't specify which one, why does one of the Razor variants have more shield capability than a Super Hornet? uh there's a ton of answers to this uh i'll start with the 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 bad answer in that uh the the super hornet is probably not where it needs to be or wants to be um no. it when we changed the shield uh i can't remember what year it was but we changed how uh, the items were classified from one like size grading to another and there were quite a few ships that didn't make the transition as cleanly as others um, and the support was one of them so I think it's probably a little under shielded but just because the that razor uh, is it the LX or the I can't remember yeah I don't know which one specifically has more shields EX or the LX uh, one, one of them's faster one of them's more shielded um, but just because it has more shields doesn't mean it's like suddenly a super dogfighter which the, the super horn is it doesn't have the armor it doesn't have the weaponry um, so it's it can be very easy to just look at the the paper stats and go this is this is better but you have to look at the the entire thing in and put it together just because just because one thing has twice the amount of the other doesn't make it twice as good you're right Maybe. you're not you're, you're, you're right in most cases um I don't have it. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move into uh, it, it's, we're, we're we're almost halfway through the show, so let's move into some general ship related aspects and that question that we've uh, I've been talking about that we'll get to here. Uh, today's ships are made far better than those of just a few years ago. That's nice for you know new ships and new stuff, but what incentive do players have to acquire and operate many of those older ships? Some of which are the signature video vehicles of Star Citizen, like the Hornet, the Super Hornet, and the Constellation. 
I think we touched on it in the previous questions that we, we are. I know. That's why I kept sure... telling you to wait for this one. <laughs> and we are going to make sure they all have uh, equality in terms of gameplay functionality. And um, yeah, there's, they do have some issues at the moment, but those ships are definitely not underplayed. Uh, we, we look at the, the stats regularly, both from a, an ownership and a playtime and the combat ones and the mission um, completion ones. And that again, that will tie into one of the future questions about what triggers a, a rework. Um, but for for their issues, they, they are certainly not being ignored both internally by us and by players. Yeah, and I mean, like visually with with the ships as well. I think you know, um, we, we've got quite a diverse range of, of, of manufacturers, and you know that um, that can mean that not not every manufacturer necessarily has to have the same um, aesthetics, but they should all match the same visual quality. And there's there's definitely ships that haven't been touched in a while, and there's there's no getting away from that. You know, as as a, a team progresses, there... technology progresses, as our pipeline progresses, you know, we always try and learn from the last ship. If we didn't, yeah. we'd be stupid. Um so you know we we're always learning. We're always trying to like push, you know, to get things done uh, more efficiently and, and to look prettier. You know, there's no other way of doing it. But wanna make wanna make stuff pretty. That's kind of what what we do. Um or at least what we what we try and do. Um and to kind of probably butcher a, a phrase somewhere that there's the you know it's easy to be taller when you're sitting on the, the shoulders of giants or whatever the right. phrase is that you know every time you're learning every time you're pushing and yes you know that does mean that, that some of them don't quite match the visual quality we want and um you know it's something we we do want to kind of unify but it, yeah. it's the, part and parcel of making a there, there, there are kind of two things at play here. One is that most games don't operate a live environment in the middle of their development. Yeah. So, so th this process of of building ships, you know, in each successive one, learning from the lessons of the other one and getting better as you go along, is a normal, uh, you know, uh, uh, aspect of game development. That's that's not not just normal. It's how it's supposed to work. You're supposed to get better at this as you go along. Um, it's just that you know, for most normal games, that period where you go back and you bring everything else up to, uh, you know, up to quality happens behind closed doors. The, when the game releases, they just hopefully, if everything works the way it's supposed to, you see everything at the same quality at the, at the same time. Uh, we don't have that with the model that we use. Uh, things things have to go out as we learn things. Um, and then the second thing is uh, <laughs> um, some of the th one of the things I'm quoted. Uh, saying quite often is like for everybody that's in the chat right now like you know give us the baddie merchant man give us this i'm like i'm like no you don't want it now you want it later you want it you know after all the lessons have been learned after after all the the kinks have been worked out it's like the, the longer it takes to make some of these ships the better they ultimately end up being so it's it's a it's a it's an interesting situation that we're in with Star Citizen because we operate this live environment you know during the course of our our development so but uh but yeah, as we've seen, we've remade the Freelancer four times. I think we've uh, remade the Constellation a couple of times. It's I think our, our commitment to bring, keeping these things updated and bringing them along with everything else has been shown. It's just a question of when is the right time to do it. If we do it now and there's still lessons to learn, we got to do it again. So let's 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 learn our lessons. Let's 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 refine our process as much as possible, and then every ship will have its time. And that that is like one of the I guess the luxuries of working on the, the project and using the model that we do is that we can be like super reactive to new techniques and if if, if we work out something that, that is easier and better and, and, and looks better then you know we would jump on it and I you know I have, I have worked on projects before where um, you could be you know coming right up to kind of GM in your game and it's like oh but if we did it this way it looks 10 times better and we can do it twice as fast it's like yeah but too, too, too late for that you can't, you can't do that now and you've got to just Right off and use it for the next project. And, yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, again to echo that, like where it, it's a, such a unique position that other games where you, you get it on uh, launch day and you're you're super hyped, but for some reason you don't like this thing and you you're like petitioning for developers to to change stuff. Like they're already nine months down the road on the next thing. They're like nothing's going to change. Whereas 
we actually have the ability to to react to things here. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think it, it it'll happen. It's just like everything. It's a question of priorities and and resources and all that good stuff. But I don't think anybody doubts it'll happen. Um, I feel what is like the status of this ship is armor. Uh, easy what, for them what? to say. Like. I have no audio for you, Griff. Oh, I'm sorry. You mean like because of anticipation, people are looking forward to getting it, and that weight kind of makes it harder. And not only that, but they're interacting with the game and being paid to do it. We are paying for something that we don't get to interact with at its highest potential. And I know that that's, you know, the way it goes as a backer and all of that, but I just feel like it's easy for you to say, just wait. And, you know, the longer we take and the harder we work on it, the better it'll be. But people are like 10 years in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's and easy for you to say. I, I think it gets jumbled around a little bit. Like some of the arguments that some people say are like, for example, there are some ships that were concepted real early in the project. <clears throat> And then there are ships that got concepted much later in the project, right? And the later ships, like let's say, for example, the Star Runner, right? Uh, it got out. It's been released. People have it in their hand. People who bought a Banu Merchantman, you know, back in 2014 are like, okay, I paid for this back in 2014. How do they have one? this? And right. I don't have mine. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So I, I get it, you know, from that perspective. Um, I think in some ways when they told people was like going to a restaurant and ordering your food and then watching somebody get walk their food in before order you. Food <laughs> right. Before right. You. right. Like, what are y'all doing? Where is my order? Yeah. It's, it's a, it is a definitely a uh, frustration that's understandable. I agree a hundred percent. Um, I was thinking about something they said earlier about the carrot, because when the carrot came out, there were some things that people said, how come it doesn't do such and such like the carrot in the original concept shows that it has these antennas that come out so that when you're doing quantum they scan you know and help you with navigation um and people were like where are those where are they at some the the uh the shielded windows on the front of the character that was supposed to be shutters yeah. that came out right <clears throat> but then they just said not that this makes it any better but they said well the shutters aren't needed right now because there's no asteroids and stuff flying into you so we're gonna wait on that because if we waste our time on that there's other stuff they said the same thing about the antennas in fact he said the antennas he actually saw them that they're working on the one that they have that we haven't seen, but because the wormhole stuff isn't in yet, they're not putting any urgency into putting it into the ships right now. So it's kind of like that weird balance, right? I agree with you 100%. You can't help but wish you had something in your hand, particularly when you've paid for it. But I also know for me, I've kind of said, don't put anything else in the game for me if it doesn't work. I don't need another cargo ship. I don't need another ship that you know does one thing like a reclaimer, but yeah. there's no salvage. Um, so it is, it's a, it's a weird, funky space to be in, you know, either way. Some people are happy because they get their ship that they can use right away. Like a prospector, those people are carefree and happy. Um, the people who are waiting on their Idris are like, where's my Idris? <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> so you're right. You got a good point. It's kind of crappy that the cheaper ships come out faster than the expensive ones. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I get where they're coming from, but Mm -hmm. People are putting a lot of money into this and mm -hmm. you, there has to be some form of customer satisfaction. Yeah. Like you can't just say you're a backer and so you don't get an opinion so you can just shut up until you get what you get. Yeah. Like that's, that's I, not cool. Well, I think, I don't know if they've said shut up until you get an opinion, <laughs> I, I, but I get what you're saying. And I think what they did to I help mean, but pass... That's the just that's the, like, well, well, that's the feeling that's the feeling that's the feeling i agree that this might have been one of those better things of communication that would have said if you buy a endeavor don't expect to see it until 2023 you know what i mean because then i could have made my purchase based on that right like do i want to wait till 2023 to get a ship that i paid for back in 2014 right um and i think that's the problem i think that there is that feeling of you know you we all kind of hope that certain things would come out much faster than they are and for some ships, like my Orion, 
I kind of, once I started understanding the development of this game, I'm like, whew, I'm not even thinking about this ship anymore. <laughs> as much as I want to do mining, because I just know it's going to be at the, the freaking tail it. end. Yeah. yeah. And you I would love to have it. Like right before the game comes out, if not when the game exactly. comes out. Exactly. As much as I would love to have it. Now, don't get me wrong. That's me. But I totally understand the people who maybe aren't there or don't get it or, you know, haven't been in the project very long. They buy something and they're kind of like, man, you know, I bought that back in 2016. And, uh, you know, you and I have a good friend who always talked about their Polaris, right? They're always <laughs> waiting on their Polaris, right? And uh, th as soon as something else came out before the Polaris, they're like, you know, what the heck? You know, I'm, uh, I paid for my Polaris. You know? And I, it's a lot of money. I agree. It's it's a lot of money on the table. So, uh yeah, Colossal, you know who that person is, too. Okay, let <laughs> me get back into it. There are no questions we get with related uh, relating to ship stuff. We talked about it recently on a Calling All Devs a couple months ago. Uh, any update you can give to us? Give for us uh, right it's now. still currently, as of 3.12, uh, a, uh, just a damage modifier. Um, it That will all go away with uh, physically based damage, which is actively being worked on right now, and then, then it is truly going to be properly physically modeled or physically accurate um, and it will be taking into account everything so thickness uh, slope velocity and weight of the projector coming in um, so yeah it, it will to say it would be different it will be an injustice to how different it will will be like it'll just completely change how the game works in terms of combat do I need to start worrying about the weapons back on John? sure do is that what you're telling me <laughs> All right. Uh, a while back, uh, CIG stated that ships would be limited to, uh, to uh, limited not just to what size components they can equip, but also what type of components. Uh, back in those shipyard articles, I think we, we, we wrote, John, mm -hmm. the uh, civilian, the military, the industrial type components. Are these restrictions still intended? Um, Get so ready, it's, Colossal. Again, it's something we're, we're discussing at the moment. The vehicle experience team are, are looking at it. Um, that was quite an old design, so the categories themselves will absolutely stay around, but the actual restriction of this ship can only take military and civilian uh, is something that the, the way the discussions are going internally at the moment is probably not going to stick around um, for a few reasons. Uh, it, it's an artificial restriction that, that doesn't really make any sense when all the components are all identical anyway. Um, it didn't, in theory, uh, and practice really stopped the, the people min-maxing loadouts right. because there was just so much variety in the, the categories anyway. Uh, and it sort of restricted upgradability of ships um, by going, like, here's, here's Ben's team has made 5 million components, but you, you, you only get access to 50. It's sort of shooting yourself in the foot with uh, long-term uh, gameplay there. And from the balance side, just made things just harder to deal with so we'll probably be getting rid of those restrictions not going to say absolutely yes or no right now uh, and when we do make a decision we'll we'll probably update those those shipyard articles to to have the latest and greatest info um, but the categories themselves will definitely stay the same and each category will have upsides and downsides for it Okay, I hope you guys caught that. Gigi is crocheting over there. She's showing off what she's making over there, guys. Um, <laughs> that was an interesting piece. The question was about these components. And, you know, right now we have, like, stealth and civilian, industrial, military, uh, and, they, and, they, and racing. And they say, will those still be held so that, you know, you can only put industrial components in an industrial ship, only military components in a military ship? And they said, uh, we've been thinking about getting rid of that. <laughs> So we just had this conversation the other day and with some friends and I actually was hoping that they would do that. And he just used the example. He said, well, you know, if we do that, if there's like 200 components or 500 components, you're limited now to only having access to like maybe 80 of them, 50 of them, 100 of them. And they want people to be able to, I guess, mix match. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if they go that route. I hope if they do that, they definitely put in uh there's some form of impact with using uh a, a component that's not matched to your type of ship in other words that it wears down faster or possibly overheats or something i think there should be some compatibility if you're an industrial ship you should use industrial stuff if you decide to put in military and industrial 
you know, be forewarned that there's a possibility that it may go out on you or something crazy. Uh oh, somebody just came into the chat with us, GG, and I'm sure they have something to say about this. So, uh, Colossal, <laughs> you're <Hey>. here. <laughs> you got some thoughts on this piece? I surely do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey folks, good Friday night to you all. This is your good friend Colossal. Uh, Griff, thank you for having me on. GG, it's always good to be on with you. Um, you know, oh ye of little faith, those people who sat there and said that we should have universal component users throughout the entire system. Uh, no, because, you know, it, it just gives you the opportunity to have unlimited abilities to do what you want to do and unlimited functioning and your ship is designed for a certain thing you just can't have it all you just can't <laughs> so uh i i mean it's it's i'm happy the fact that if you get a specific ship that has a civilian that may may be able to use a little bit of um stealth that's fine but you shouldn't be able to use that ship for military purposes with your with your components and things like that that's going to wear some type of endurance or some type of hp mm -hmm. or so it's going to stress out some part of the ship mm -hmm. so i think that's the intent of what cig wants uh, wants to do you need to know what you're going to buy mm -hmm. the devil's in the details and if you're going to buy something that's completely civilian and you want to try to use it for military good luck for you mm -hmm. good luck to you because you might you know wear out some type of component so you better be a smart buyer and i think that's what they want in this game so i'm i'm happy they're going this route and for those of you people who tried to go the other route i told you so i tried to tell you that they were going to do that all right so let me ask you a question <laughs> colossal what, what happens when people want to be able to militarize their civilian ship right like i've got i'm going to take my um my Connie, and I want to take not not my Connie, uh, not the standard Connie, but let's say I want to take my my Phoenix, and I want to put all military grade stuff in there. What type of impact should there be for me to do that? Should I should I be able to go one hundred percent military, or should I only be able to maybe go fifty percent of it? The other you know whatever percent has got to be civilian, uh, or you know maybe I can only put one industrial. I mean, should I be able to go full military in a civilian ship? No. You shouldn't. Okay. I mean, you, you got other things like an IRR, you got EM signatures and, and things like that. So mm -hmm. if you want to try to go ahead and try to skirt through without mm -hmm. anybody knowing, you better not put a military component in your ship. Mm, that's right. I mean, it's, it's just that simple. It's going to hike up your IRR mm -hmm. and you're sitting here running around here talking about, I want to go ahead, do, 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 do. I want to transport Joe Smo, um, transport Joe Smo, but you got your IRR signature th through the roof. Yeah. So if somebody's going to be able to, you know, have some good scanners and sensors out there, they're going to detect you quicker than they detect somebody who, who has stealth components. True. Okay. You know, so like I said, you got to be, uh, these are the things that they're, they're putting in game. You, if you want less casualty, then you put components that are comparable to your ship that would allow that, such as reducing of IR signature. Or you know, reducing of EM signatures and things like that. That could possibly help also against uh, targeting when it comes to missiles. Absolutely. That person may have missiles straight for EM, and you got an EM so low they they're not going to be able to target you. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware of what your components can do and what it dishes out in terms of endurance, HP, EM, IR, all that good stuff. CS, I believe. Yep. All yep. that stuff is in there. Well, those are all good points to mention. I think that sometimes, you know, there's a, you're going into the detail levels of Star Citizen. And I think maybe some people, not everybody, because there are people who are very much aware of the things you're talking about. But there are some people who will only look at that initial labeling, such as, oh, they think that because it's military, that means, oh, this has got to be the best thing to put in my ship, only to find out that they're handicapping themselves in the long run. Uh, because, like you said, they've given themselves away, maybe in the area of ERIR. Um, but I, I am curious to see how CIG is going to balance that. You know, I do understand this whole piece. Okay, Gigi, I do understand the whole thing about wanting to make sure that we have access to many of the things in the game and that things aren't blocked. But I also understand if they're going to do that, that there definitely should be some consequence if you decide to use those things. And, and like you said, those may be the perfect consequences to make people think twice. You know, right. Mm -hmm. And and it also, I mean, we're not only just talking about weapons, we're talking about the ability to quantum out as well, because mm -hmm. they also hindered that you may be able to get a military component that may be able to have you spool quickly. Yeah. You may be able to get a, 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 a civilian component mm -hmm. that may not be able to spool quickly, but calibrate quickly. I mean, there, right. there are things that you 
this game is a lot more detailed than I think people uh, actually are paying attention to. A lot of us who do play the game are paying attention to that, but th there are a lot of people who who uh, who have subscribed to it who have not paid attention mm -hmm. to that type of an aspect. Mm -hmm. And you better know what you're buying, and you better be careful about what you're putting on it before you put things on it. Good point. Admiral Kusanagi, hey, good evening. He puts a point here. He says a civilian Cessna is not engineered to hold the technological components that a military plane would have. And I'm talking about even if they're of similar size. So yeah, good point. Um, again, it will be very interesting to see how CIG, I love the fact that there's all that variety out there. Um, I know for testing purposes, they've given us access to every component so that we could try things out and do variations and that they're paying attention to that as part of the development. But again, as this gets more refined, as Colossal was saying, as this whole thing gets more and more refined, they do want us to be thinking about why did I purchase this? You know, what can I afford to purchase? And if I if I buy this, what are the compromises that I'm gonna you know have to deal with if I buy a certain thing? Or what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? And the fact that those components are swappable, I think there are reasons even for that, where you will literally swap out certain things. But then there are certain things you may keep in your ship all the time. You may keep your shielding a certain way just because of the type of work or career that you do. But then again, there may be other times where you swap out other things. Colossal mentioned about stealth. Uh, maybe there are pros and cons for why you do that. So again, we'll see what CIG comes up with. You know, it's all good stuff. Okay, let's uh, keep it rolling I here. The, you know, John mentioned like the ship partners themselves. They they yeah they're long overdue a bit of a bit of TLC. I think um, I think we we I think it was two point six maybe. It was a while ago. It was when I was fairly new to the company. I remember having taken on those ship items and yeah we did a whole whole load of work getting them ready. Um, and they've kind of not really been greatly touched since. Um, and you know now we're getting to the point where we are adding them into ships and you know having the panels open and stuff I, i'd really like to see that stuff sort of like you know, that game loop closed out and really kind of getting that, that stuff i mean we, we went through and made loads of you know sub items that go inside your ship items that go inside your ships and we've got a whole slew of them and, and you know kind of getting all that stuff um in working feature ready Pretty cool uh liberty in the chat says is this show pre-recorded yes um what else do we got uh as it stands uh the carrick is the only non-capital ship with a med bay and the kraken is a capital ship without a med bay uh why don't more multi-crew ships have med bays of any tier whatsoever uh I, i'm pretty sure the kraken will end up with one when we actually put it into production that was almost certainly just an oversight at the the concept uh, stage uh, I don't think the Carrick is the only non-capital ship with a med bay because we have the we have the Apollo and the Cutlass Red. Mm. I guess it's a bit vague what, what you call a med bay versus what you call a med bed, the different tiers of med beds. Um, but it's it's certainly not intentional that there's just those three ships in the game only only ever going to have them. Um, but it is a supremely powerful feature mm. to have in your ship. So we don't want every ship and its son having. Uh, a med med bed in there that you have as your mobile respawn point. So we do want to restrict the the availability of those to ships that make sense. So the Kraken would make sense because it is sort of like a mobile space station. The Carrick is a supremely long distance exploration ship where you're going to be out in the deep expanse of space a long time. But having it in the back of your Cutlass, like your bog standard Cutlass that you just chucked in there, maybe not. But the red again designed as an ambulance. Um, so yeah, it. Didn't there, the... there will be a difference between, and I think we've we've shown uh, sneak previews of things like the the med gun as well. There will be other ways to heal yourself beyond a med bed going forward. So you won't need a med bed in the back of your ship if you break your legs on a planet. Um, you'll be able to use other mechanics to to heal yourself. Um, but med beds will be primarily for the, the whole respawning aspect. Uh, so be aware of that. Only so many ships are going to have med beds. Um, yeah, for those of you who were hoping that they'd put them on some of the bigger battle cruisers and things like that, it ain't looking so hot for that. Colossal, you got any thoughts about the whole med bed thing? I don't want to get started on that. I mean, <laughs> unbelievable. I mean, what do you guys want? Do you guys want a gold tooth and two tongues that go different directions? I mean, it makes no sense. I love you guys, by the way. It, 
I mean, not every ship can have everything. <laughs> a, a Kraken with a med bay, that's the whole point. Remember I said, you live on a ship, you that you die and you, you, you what you live on a uh, on a, on a, on a what, what what's that ship called? You live on a Drake. Um, Kraken is a is a, a Drake, Drake, right? You live on a Drake, you die on a Drake, right? So <laughs> with that being the case, a Drake has a cutlass red. And the last time I seen with a Kraken, you can have multiple ships on there, including a cutlass red. Use the cutlass red for your med bay. A lot of people just want a ship where they just go ahead and just wake up on and spawn on and spawn on, and they want a medical bed for every last ship, and it doesn't work that way. That Kraken is not designed for that. I know they're going to try to go ahead and slip one in there, but your best bet is to have maybe a medical room mm. where you can have medical supplies mm. and try to keep that person alive as much as possible and maybe use that uh, Cutlass Red that's docked on that, on that ship to go ahead and do what you need to do. Other than that, like I said, every ship has its limitations and I don't think a Kraken should have a medical bay. Mm -hmm. You know, this goes to a point you just mentioned too, Kimmy, I'm not Kimmy, uh, Colossal. The um, This gives excuse for why you would have like that Apollo escorting your ship, right? Like, I'm thinking about like in the military, they literally have military ships that are medical ships, right? And my point is, is that who says that you can't have a medical ship like an Apollo that's also in with your escort so that if something does happen, that's where your people go. That's the facility that's there. I know a lot of times people do want, you said it earlier, that Frankenstein ship that everything is on that one ship. <laughs> but there's a different way of looking at it. Instead of everything being on one ship, how about we have every type of player playing with us, which introduces a whole different type of dynamic. So those people who are into medical, now when you are going out with your Kraken, uh, Nihilus, <laughs> you could say, hey, Griff, I know you're into medical. I'm making a run. How would you like to bring your team and give me an escort out here for my 20 people who are on my Kraken? That, that's another form of gameplay that could be used too. So your, your point's well made. Okay. Right. I actually disagree. I feel like the Kraken does need a med bay. Well, I think Colossal said, I don't know if you're here when he said it. Anything that has the intent of not having to come down should have medical ability. Uh, well, okay. okay. See, here's the reason why I'm on a, on a different side. Chris Roberts said that he wanted this to be a multi-player type game. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have other people's play with you in this game in order to, for you to do what you want to do. And I, mean, I think that's one so good way of doing it. Alone anyway. There's oh, no right. way you're taking off a Kraken by yourself. You'd be surprised. <laughs> There'd be some knuckle hits who will. But I, but, <laughs> but, 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 yeah, but, but you're I'm saying talking about those people who are playing the game seriously and not just flying a Kraken around for the sake of it. Yeah. If I'm going to be in space and I'm likely going to be using this as a homestead wherever I set it down, I think it should have medical capability. I mean, well, I'll be a doctor. I'll, I'll fly. Or I, I have an RSI Apollo. I'll go ahead and fly to the side and and do what y'all need me to do to help you guys out. But it's just when you got those ships that are specifically designed for one thing or the other, that's a carrier ship. Uh, I don't know how long she's going to be able to stay out because that may cost some money unless you get the privateer. Um, but, uh, you know, when you're when you have another ship that's specifically designed for that, that you can go ahead and modulate. It's essentially a flying space station. To say that a flying space station shouldn't have medical capabilities is kind of crazy. No, I didn't say it shouldn't have medical capabilities. I said it shouldn't have a medical bed. But we're talking about the spawning It bed. should have a medical bed. Yeah. Okay, it should have a medical room where you can go ahead and use the tools. Mm -hmm. But it, you shouldn't have a medical bed where somebody's going to spawn into with a level one, two, or three bed. If anything, minimum, maybe a level one bed or whatever level bed they're saying that just says it mends a cut or a bruise. That's it. Yeah, this, I think the yeah, spawning I, bed. I just, I, we have to agree. I agree. I I fully believe there should be a spawning bed on something like that. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, that's fair enough. I was gonna say I would put it into a category of the ships that, and there are only a few ships that fit this category of the ships that go out and, for example, cannot land on a planet. There's only a few ships like that. Uh, the javelin is like that. We know the Idris can land. The Kraken can land. The privateer can land. Um, the whole seas cannot land. Um, I think the ships that do have 
I don't even know enough a Carex bid. I think a Carex bid is only a tier two, and that um, and same thing with the eight ninety. Yeah, both of those are only I think tier two bids. I don't think that they do like from death respawning. So the only ships that really have that are the uh, Endeavor. What's the other one? What's the RSI one? The Apollo. Correct. Those are the only two. I'm talking about resurrect you from the dead. Right. <laughs> Those are the only two they resurrect you from the dead. You can have other ones that do other stuff. Oh wow, Uber Nerd. He's giving us the raid with 19 big ones. Uber Nerd, thank you so much for the raid. Okay, so we are at a as always, Uber Nerd delivers late night delivery. Thank you, Uber Nerd folks, for coming and joining us. We are doing a review on Star Citizen Live. Hopefully you guys have, you probably have already seen it, but we're just kind of having a little discussion about it. But we're almost, well, we're a little bit past the halfway point. So let's go ahead and uh, jump back in. We have a three-way vote in relation to the medical piece here. So here we go. Does the 890 jump have? 890, yeah, has one. Okay. But I guess the, the question was, uh, is it sub, sub capital ships yeah. having them? Cap capitals tend to, because again, by their nature and size, they're, they're often long distance, long duration. Five episodes, Uber Nerd. Oh my it's God! Go to bed, get some rest, rest your eyes. Thanks again. Yeah. <laughs> um, any update whatsoever on player-facing ship modularity? Uh, several ships uh, are supposed to have a variety of player-swappable modules. Uh, some including entire rooms. You touched on the Retaliator earlier. Yeah. Uh, the the tech for doing. Uh, I'll I'll concentrate on the room aspect of it because it's the the probably the most important and mm -hmm. and the easiest one to answer uh, the tech for having swappable rooms is being uh put, well, it is on the schedule for early next year um it's to not give a super long winded tech answer it it was blocked by moving some of our data from uh loose xml into our our own data forge format um, so it could tie in with other systems because those rooms, especially the retaliated ones, have items inside them. So they needed to, when attached and detached from the ship, needed to be able to dynamically connect and unconnect uh, from it. So the items inside would continue to work. Uh, so that was the reason why it's taken so long to do it. But that, that work is now scheduled. And when it's online, like I said earlier, the, the retaliators will be the, the first ones to, to have it proved out because we have all the assets all there waiting and ready and then once that's done been in the game for a cycle and we we found any issues with it we'll we can start going and look at the other the other ships with it that sort of okay i've got to shout and praise god right now because i unmelted my retaliator bomber so <laughs> i am excited to hear that they are looking at modularity for ships and the first one they're going to work on is the retaliator which is awesome and they said they've already got the assets there all they have to do is just get ready for it it's on the schedule for next year and for those of you who own ships like the caterpillar and other modular ships that means yours will be next so this is good good news stuff i'm gonna I'm gonna I'm 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 do my thing where i roll back the idea that the retaliators are we are what we intend to be the first implementation just with the realities of see Ben is like, like yeah, I was John it happened to John not me uh, it's just that with the realities of game development we know these priorities can change but right now yes our intention retaliator uh, will be the first um, at some point at some point um, let's see uh, kind of a similar question I guess uh, what tech is blocking our ability for ships uh, to save the current setups, such as MFDs and settings like firing groups and overclocking, so that when we respond with uh, a ship and get them back from our factory, our preferred setup comes back and we don't have to. Yeah, Admiral, I was saying, look on the gray market for them. That's how I got mine. Scratch. Yeah. Um, that's not particularly for the vehicle team to answer. That's more of the, like, the general persistence back ends guys. Uh, but from the, the vehicle facing side of it, um, we want to. Um, we've talked about this before, having the, the MFD rework, moving them away from their current system to building blocks. And as part of that, you're going to be getting a setting, like a ship settings screen that you can you can set all these things in. And then there's a single place that we can send off. Like here's, here's this ship settings. 
and it's just one place that gets sent and retrieved and then works across your ship rather than having to pull all this data from all these various locations on the ship and package it off and get it back. Um, so I, yeah, I can't really comment on half of it, but from the vehicle side, it, we need to have those new NFTs done first. Mm. Um, this may this answer may go into the same area then. Uh, for the past year and a half or so, uh, ground vehicles cannot be loaded into vehicle bays that use lifts instead of ramps uh, because they clip through and fall out. Uh, can you tell us about the issue and is, if there's any fix on the horizon? It's definitely something the physics guys are looking at. Uh, it'd be really good if you could ever nail down one of those guys to, to get on. Get on here. I know they're incredibly camera shy um, because they, they can explain it really well. But from, from my designer understanding of it, uh, it is what it's doing is it's teleporting or interpolating the, the lift as it goes up. And if you have a dip in frame rate or the server has a dip in frame rate or anything gets out of sync slightly, that, that, that one frame or two frames or three frames where it's out of sync, it's now the wheels are through the bottom of it. And it has a choice of which way am I gonna push this out to get out of this collision? And sometimes it goes up the right way and sometimes it goes down the wrong way. And then as soon as one wheel's in, it's starting to drag all the rest in and then it, it tends to go wrong. Um, but it is something we know about, something we, we do intend to fix. They, they have put numerous fixes in almost every patch that, yeah. that makes it better. Um, but it, there are still some, some edge cases there. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, we, don't, we don't want ramps on all ships. <laughs> We definitely want lifts. Okay. You don't know, like ramps? I don't mind ramps. I just think lifts look cool. Like pressing the button would be like, Shh. yeah. I mean, I guess. Uh. You you would end up with sh ships looking very similar. You'd have like the the freelancer shape where it loads in the back, or right. the character shape where it loads yeah, in the front, or think, the star lifter where it does both. I think it, it definitely works on some ships, but there is that sort of. A ramp takes up quite a considerable amount of space and has a big impact on the exterior because you know, it has to arc down and be a certain length. Otherwise, you just get problems trying to get in the ramp if it's too, you know, too steep. Yeah. Then th th there's other problems that come alongside with it. So have have you considered side ramps? Side ramps. <laughs> I don't uh, know. No. I'm trying to. We did have uh, a concept ship where it has side ramps as part of the brief. I think it may be in the Corsair, but it never survived. Right. No, at one point in the Corsair, yeah. At one point in the Corsair. It, it had side ramps. Um, but a good point on the ramp stuff is that we do have metrics for the angles, and we can't go over a certain amount, which means if you have a ship that has loads of stuff on the bottom of it, it's going to be 10, 15 meters up in the air. You have a 10, 15, 20 degree ramp coming off the back. It could be 50 meters long by the time it gets to yeah. the ground and then you've got somewhere to put a 50 meter ramp yeah. in the ship yeah the the, the, the terrapin i guess has a side ramp too yeah yeah it's just not big enough to load i was gonna say, okay i was gonna say not big enough You're to load vehicles i've in, seen but i've seen vehicles. exactly the second i was i didn't even get through it and i was like no i've seen people do it take both the wings off and put something in. <laughs> um yeah and, and i mean it, yeah it's something that the I've been talking about today with the lifter and, and you know, making sure that ramps kind of fit fit purpose and, you know, it, it is long enough and the correct angle and everything because, you know, you don't want to drive yourself in the back of it and just get wedged. What you need to do is eventually you just need to do something like a like a Chinook where it doesn't have a lift or a ramp or anything. It just <laughs> grabs it and carries it around. It can just go and pick up other things and slide them in. Uh, we, 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 discussed, uh, we discussed a Chinook style ship way back on the gosh two or three years ago now um in one of the shows i can't remember what this is where ben gets to pitch his favorite ship concept idea oh what's your favorite I'm ship say i'm not saying it here <laughs> it's fine i got roasted enough for saying it in the meeting i did say it in, so. um is there an update on the customization options that the 300 series received uh uh, we, 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 we said then that we'd be using it for other ships. Uh, there hasn't been another ship uh, using the same customization system as the 300 uh, since then. Uh, is there more coming? What are our intentions? What can you tell us, if anything? Definitely plan to do more of them. Uh, it's a, it's a time, time reward thing. It, it, the, the 300 took a lot of development time because it was the first. 
Uh, we learned a lot of it from the dev side. We learned a bit from what uh, players liked on the other side of it, what they didn't like. And it's really just finding another ship to to do it on and release it on um, because it does add time onto the schedule. So it's a case of we, we could release this ship at this date or you could do it with customization and it's one, two quarters later. And like, do we want to do that or do we just want to have the ship out? So uh, the, those discussion on it is definitely going to happen in the future and absolutely going to happen for things like cockpit de decorations. Yeah, I think the the kind of like the decoration side of it, um, when we when we first started talking about that a while ago on the prop side, we did a, a whole bunch of you know like ones that we could use the prototype with and play with, and everyone really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, we definitely want to get to the point where you can go and you know find these really unique um, assets that you can kind of you know show off in your ship and and, and decorate your ship with um, things that you know not yeah you, know, you can't just nip down to the local landing zone and buy, but but things are that are a little bit more unique. And it, every so often it, that kind of topic of conversation comes up. It's like yeah, we, you know everyone's excited about doing it everyone's excited about making the assets and, and having fun doing it um so i think once 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 that comes online we, we should start seeing a, a lot of that stuff were you surprised by how many how popular the coffee maker was uh i'm not gonna lie that coffee maker's given me a few headaches like like <laughs> uh, uh, jens who, who on, on the program side of things he's uh he's like are we, are we gonna the coffee maker is working, isn't it? It is, it is working because I keep seeing images of it not not working on Reddit, and it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll, it better be working. Um, but yeah, everyone loves coffee. What can I say? Um, I think we touched on this one earlier, John. Uh, will there be a fix coming out for shield holes in the upcoming patches, like those of the constellation lineup? Uh, you j if you just want to reiterate you, the answer. Yeah, here. so S SDF shields will ultimately fix it uh, completely. Uh, in the interim, we're just. Uh, patching them up as best as we can. Um, there's some less than ideal design uh, changes that we can do to do it, but it involves having to actually find how they're being done in the first place. So I think I think we have probably got about 80% of them, maybe 9% of them temporarily worked around. It causes other issues, but those issues are less problematic than um, the shield holds themselves. Yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot of things coming with those SDF shields that folks are excited about. Yeah. Um, what are some of the current challenges or technical hurdles to spawning ships and vehicles inside of other ships and vehicles? Which uh, is a bit of that, I guess. Um, so it's technical wise, we're actually having to solve a lot of these right now whilst we're working on the, the Merlin and Constellation docking because that really brings the problem to, to a head. Um, a really good example for the Merlin and Connie is, and the guys have fixed it now, but it took an incredibly long time to do it. Uh, when you spawned in Arena Commander with the Constellation, uh, it actually put you inside the Merlin <laughs> because the Merlin was the, the last pilot seat in the order of the vehicle. Uh, so it just put you in there instead. Um, and you it put you in there, but it thought you were in the Constellation pilot seat. So you were flying the Constellation from the Merlin's seat uh, and all sorts of weird stuff like the, the Constellation had access to all the Merlin's items. So it would start trying to fire the Merlin's guns. Um, you could turn off you could turn off the other ship's items from within the other one. Uh, just all these edge cases that we, we have to work through. And then you go into the weird, I say weird, but it's it's stuff that players will do, uh, where you go to your ASOP terminal and you've got a Constellation and a Merlin in your account. But technically that Merlin is attached to your Constellation. So we need to hide it from the ASOP terminal uh, until you've gone in the VMA and removed that Merlin from the Constellation, at which point it should turn up back up in the ASOP. And then you get into weird scenarios like, I've spawned my Merlin from the ASOP terminal and I've crashed it and I claim it. Does it now go back as a separate loose item to the ASOP terminal or is it going back to the Constellation and all the combinations of that? Like, I spawned a Merlin, my friend uh, has got it in it. I've got in my constellation, I've gone somewhere else, I've logged out and I've respawned. By default, that Merlin should have been attached to me, but he's still flying it around somewhere. Lots and lots and lots of edge cases that like the technical side of docking and undocking the ships 
uh, was relatively easy. And it's the time just spent on all these edge cases that we have to solve first. Uh, in game development, weird is a global term for anything that a player will do. Yeah. Um, let's see what we got from the chat here. Um, how come the canopy bug that was once known for the Hornet series only has now infected virtually all single-seater single, -seated, single, single -seater ships? We'll just go from there. Uh, it's weird that it only affected a few ships because it should have and did affect every single ship. So why it was like such a slow, like this patch, it was this ship, and this patch, it was this ship and this ship. It, it should have been all of the ships at the same time. And uh, the, the 312 build that went to Yuvakati the other day had a fix for it, uh, but we had to roll that back because it caused some other impacts. Um, but we're... We're definitely working on it, and it, it absolutely shouldn't have been ship specific. Uh, it should have been any ship that you had, any ship that required a part of the ship to move before you got in it. So any ship with a moving canopy, like the Vandal ships, where the the sticks do something first, and then the the, the massage bed uh, drops out for you to get on, um, would okay. have been affected. Now, now I just want to clip when you say it should have affected all ships that, that you're, not, you're not speaking about like an intention like the the, the bug was no, intended to affect everything it just it just it was a systemic issue with the way that uh, an, animations that attach to the cockpit were it's like we were surprised that it only ever affected a small yes. yeah it, uh, it absolutely was not intended that whilst flying around your canopy should <laughs> constantly open and close like, uh, like a hoopty yeah or in the case of the vandal <laughs> ships just Dropping you outside the ship every now and then, um, uh, but you said we had we had a fix in three twelve. We had to roll it back uh, because it had other knock ons that were unintended. Yeah, uh, it, it had a strong chance of not actually letting you get out the ship again. So you can't be didn't open and close, but you could never get yeah. out the ship. Yeah, no, it, it was particularly vicious with the vandal ships because it was just yeah. it just yeeted you right out of the ship. Just like thanks. Um, all right, uh, we've got. A little less than 10 minutes left. Let's jump into some uh, uh, some general process stuff. Um, how are ships prioritized? One, one of the most common questions that we get through all of these streams is, how do we determine which ship gets made first, next, what this after this? Uh, we, our history is replete with many instances of, we're going to do this, and then we want to do this, and then we want to do that. That team will move from this ship to this ship, and we, we, ha we always have our intentions. And then three months goes by, six months goes by, those intentions change, those priorities change. Yeah. Uh, how does this work? Uh, the, there is no singular uh, criteria for, for organizing it. Uh, it's a combination of what staff we have free to work on things like obviously if we only had one person free to work on a ship they're not we're not going to put them on working on a capital ship for multiple years uh it at this well, about two months ago so q3 of every year uh i sit down with the exec so chris uh Aaron, tony and some of the the other directors like todd and uh anyone that has like a vested interest in a vehicle coming right. out into the game and we sit down and we look at the backlog of ships and go right what 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 ships do we want to release next year what is going to add to the game and we give our like these are our top five and then we go and see whether there's any consistencies there and that usually pulls out a few and then i go away and work with the production and go right you can't you can only have one of these because this is a big ship that's going to take all of the next, like you can have this ship, but it, that's the only ship you're going to get next year. And I go, well, I don't, don't, don't want that. So then we go backwards and forwards and we spend a few weeks going like, we want this one and we'll have these two, these will fit. We have this event at this date that needs this ship for it because of X reason. So that has to go in. Um, and if we have any time left over, then, then it's sort of internal like team choice of we have a four month period so are there any small little ships that we want to squeeze in there or do we want to look at doing a, a rework of a ship yeah. uh, and that's how it goes in a lot of ways it's, it's important to keep everybody busy to keep everybody working to keep everybody engaged and i think there's this there's this misconception that anybody can work on anything 
I mean, we, we, we saw it just a couple of weeks ago, you know, when IAE started and the website went down. I'm doing a show with I, AI guys. And they're like, why are you here? Why are you not fixing the website? And I'm like, these are artificial intelligence programmers, people. What do you want them to do about the website? It's, it's, there, there, there's this idea that everybody can work on everything. And, and even within ship artists, even with, within the people that work on ship artists, artists have different styles. Artists have different aptitudes. There are people that you would put on Drake. Like, okay, these are the people that we should work on Drake. But you wouldn't put them on Origin because it's outside of their uh, aptitudes. Yeah, I, I think, like, you know, Every member of the team is, is, is you know, a capable artist, but definitely people have things that they feel more comfortable with. And, and just sometimes people just click better with certain things. And then we have, like, um, within the team, you know, you always want someone that's a bit more technical and has a bit of a better understanding of, of what the whys and hows as opposed to necessarily the ones that can, you know, make stuff that's, like, just, just super pretty. And, and so that, you know, otherwise you end up with a ship that looks great, and but everything's broken. Yeah, and, and you yeah, know, then it becomes real frustration of having to backwards and forwards with, with design and tech people to try and get that stuff working. So you do need to sort of, I mean, I guess that goes with any any kind of walk of life. You always want to get make sure that the right people are focusing on the right things. And that's something you do as sort of like a, a lead and a manager and, and everything else is, you know, kind of um, trying to make sure you're, you're playing to people's strengths. Um, and, and there is that, you know, when, when we get on to kind of doing some of our kind of um, more alien ships and, and things that are kind of a, a little bit um, less, you know, hard surface and, and things like that that we, we may or may not tackle in the future. Um, see, see, Jared, <laughs> it loose. Um, but uh, you know, there will certainly be like a learning curve for a lot of a lot of members of the team with with that stuff. And it might be that you know certain aspects of the ship um, may require more specialist skill sets. Um, so you have to make sure those artists are free and, and ready to jump on it. Um, and then, yeah, I think it, it is just, I guess it's just about managing time. Sorry, I'm, I'm rambling. No, it's fine. The, the, the manufacturer point is a really good point. Um, I, we have, it, it was never intentional, but the different studios have sort of ended up being the, the go-to teams for different manufacturers. Like the, the US guys are really good with RSI and Drake ships. So if, if we decided one year we wanted to only do RSI and Drake ships, um, those would primarily go to the US team, but there's only so many of them. And if the UK guys were, were given them, they'd be able to do it, but it would take them that bit longer versus if it was an Origin or an Aegis ship. So then that's that's where you see things start moving around. Um, or we, we have a, an event where there was a request for one thing and it turned into two things, and that's a non-negotiable request that we suddenly need to adjust course and go, well, actually, we're going we're gonna to pause this ship for a bit and then we'll do this and then we'll come back to it. And then that's where the often, uh, where I, I do read the comments quite often where it said, John Crew said this team is going to be doing this ship and then they're going to move on to this ship. And that absolutely was the intention at the time. Just something happened in the middle that caused that to be paused and then they'll get back to it. Uh, I, and, cannot stress this enough that when we do these shows in i'm on i'm on year six of, of 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 doing these things for star citizen here when we do these shows and when we give these answers these are always always our best understanding and intention of uh, regarding things at this time uh it's game development, not game construction. We're all learning as we go along. We're all discovering the best way to make the best damn space sim ever. You know, as as we go along, we're we're always finding new ways. New people come on, they join the they join the team, and they show us new ways. And they go, oh, okay, you know, so like this. Uh, it's so. It's 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 all it's we you see a lot of you know CIG lied or CIG said this or whatever, but it's just it's never enough times to remind folks that when. Something John about me is just show, not buying ben that. The show or anybody else, Todd, uh, Richard Tyrer, Sean Tracy, any of the, and they, and that we are sharing our intentions and our understandings of the process at any given time. So, uh, and as with all things, subject to change. So we are just about out of time. So I had all these questions about the Banu Merchantman here that I was saving for the end. I have to skip them. Uh, a bit based. No, okay. So, all of these questions are going to have pretty much the same answer, guys. But we're gonna we're gonna do them so that you so that you hear them, and so that you know them, 
and so that you don't say that we didn't answer them. Uh, from the th uh, from the thread here. I'm going to stop here because it's come up in the chat. Can you, can you elaborate just a little bit? I don't know. They gave this long-winded explanation for why things aren't coming out in the order that we expect it to, but... Your speaker's uh, cycling. Out in the order. Is that better? Yep, yeah, that's better. Yeah. That was a that was a very long way to say we're not really gonna tell you. Mm. Is what I feel like that was. Okay. I feel like that was a lot of words for we don't really know, we're just throwing darts at a wall and seeing what sticks. Hmm. And I don't know, I just feel like they should be a little more organized at this point. Mm. Okay. Fair enough. No, I don't think it's reasonable. Okie doke. I'm going to keep it rolling. We're almost done. Uh, any status updates on the Redeemer? Uh, it's in white box right now. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it's solid concept. Looking cool. Had a bit of a review with the guys today. Uh, excited about it. No, and it's we should. Bit of a tight space. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it may or may not still be a five-man crew. It may be less. Okay. And we showed some of that on Calling All Devs mm. a month or two ago, so check that out for this. Uh, Constellation Taurus, why is it taking so long? Uh, I sort of alluded to earlier. It's it's one of those ships that is very easy to, to pause on when we need to pivot to, to do something else that's come up, like a, a patch is on fire and we need the vehicle team to fix a load of things. Uh, it's, it's just a... There's nothing secret or special going on with it. It's just a, a very easy one to go, right, we can stop here and we can come back to it in a bit. Okay. Um, anything you can tell us about the Polaris? Uh, it's had a reconcept pass. It's got fractionally larger. It's not humor, isn't it? It's still in the 100s in terms of meters. Okay. And when you say reconcept, you mean mostly to flesh out like the interior and, and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, the, the interior has a, a full pass done on it. Um, the, the only other big thing of note i guess it's got a docking collar nicely on it now and the hangar is two metric yep. and uh some of the images in uh, isc yesterday uh, may have been related to this some of that polaris reconcepting um anything you can tell us about the javelin we'll just get progressively uh, bigger bigger uh yeah it's big that's is this big yeah, 500 meters of big. Um, I think people saw it at Fleet Week. It's, it's had some changes since then. Okay. Um, uh, Hull C. Uh, be real careful here. Uh, <laughs> no, no active production on the content side. Uh, we have done some work on the the Hull A concept, which may roll over into the the visual of the Hull C. So the IE Hollow viewers, you saw the actual reconcepted Halle. Um but tech wise I've, I've spoken about the blockers for it many times and they they are slowly slowly going away so docking is a big one that, that is on the horizon um animating viz areas now works animating grids now works so we're, we're sort of down to docking and cargo and a few minor other things yeah cargo <laughs> I mean, a, a, a minor thing related to the call c well that's a classic case of you know um that the Halle, like John said, is you know, having a new concept. It's like, that's, that's okay. really cool. Um, and then finally, the Banyan Merchantman. Cancelled. Oh, really? <laughs> oh. Uh, it's, it's in concept again. Uh, anyone that's a BMM fan knows that the, the concepts were quite different depending on which, which version you saw. So it's bringing them all in line, making everything fit in it. Uh, it has got bigger, but it is... Um, not gone up a landing pad size, so it's still in the same size category. Uh, it still has the same amount of cargo as it was concepted with, so we've not cut the cargo, and we're, we're working on the interior to, to bring all the stuff we learned from the Defender inside. Concepts for the interior. 
concept for me yeah. too. Uh, All concept. And folks, as far as when you can expect to see that, when I would say when the Banning Richardman actually begins like active development, when, 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 when things actually start being built, is probably the next time you can expect to see some of that stuff. So, yeah, that's going to be a big one. It's going to be, yeah, it's not yeah. going not going to be soon. Just put it that way. Um, and then um, uh, the Genesis Starliner, which comes from somebody who's not me. Mm. I don't, don't believe you. <laughs> uh, I'm the one Genesis Starliner fan in the world. It it, it needs the concept uh, pass on it. Um, just because it's it's one of those older ships that was done and doesn't have the modern metrics to it, so I can't really say a lot about it. I know it was done in yay old days. I just I'm sure it'll have the mix master to keep everyone happy with it. <laughs> I love that we we do some pre gaming here, and Ben's answer was, "I don't understand this question." But the Tensa Starliner, it's, it's the best. It's, it's, it's All you need to know is mix master. I, I don't All right, guys, we are over time. Thank you, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we don't have a host uh, this week, so we're just going to leave it here, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for our uh, post-IAE free fly uh, Q&A. Remember, uh, there is still a Perseus Q&A uh, scheduled to go out sometime soon. That's with the community team. I don't know when it's going out, but you can check the thread up on Spectrum there. Um, and uh, yeah, and then we'll be back here next week for our last episode of the year. Uh, we're going to have Todd Pappy and uh, Richard Tyra on to talk about all things Alpha 3.12. So for John and for Ben, I'm Jared. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, we'll see you next week. Take care. Yes. Okay, 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 okay. A lot of information in there, in packed into one hour. Um, that latter part that we just heard. I know Fast Cart's out there. For those of you who own BMMs, it was good to hear that they are working on it, but they've also said that it's going to be a little while. So that's going to be interesting to see. Colossal, do you own you own a BMM? BMM? I, I do. Okay. Yes. Okay. And I'm still waiting on something. Like I said, I put on the chat earlier, Just I, I'll pay you 25 cents for some new concept. A cargo bay or maybe the bazaar area or something like that. We I understand it's getting bigger and things like that. I do understand that they also said that, <laughs> that yeah, Kimmy. I do also understand that they said that they were gonna do the Polaris before they do the BMM. Yep. But I remember several years ago they said they were gonna put start working on the BM after a certain citizen con. Mm -hmm. And uh um, we're still waiting on that. Yep. Um agreed. I will say this can I say this I, I, real quick? I will say this. It was good to hear that they are that they reconcepted it because there have been like four or five different versions of what the BMM supposed to look like. And, and none of them have been like, you know, other than that very first weird one that they had, there's we don't really have an official one. You know what I mean? We just had artist drawings. And so it would be good to finally say, OK, this is what it's going to finally look like. So I'm kind of glad to hear that they are trying to bring those images together and finally come up with a concept that verified, you know. I guess on the on, on and that's fair enough. But on, on the flip side of it is, we never knew, we never saw an official, right, finalized version of a concept. We right. heard that exactly. it could look like this, it could look like that, mm -hmm. it could look like this. So even with that information on, well, we we, we got some concepts on it, it's still not giving me any types of excitement because mm -hmm. we still haven't even gotten a finalized version. Like, for example, I'm going to give you a good example of that, a Redeemer. Yeah. We've yeah. had that finalized concept for a hot minute, and, yeah. they, and, and they still, you know, they're they working on that. We've had a finalized version of the Taurus, which, by the way, was a poor excuse on uh, on on why they haven't finished. Mm -hmm. Because it's been out for a long time, mm -hmm. and I mean, and their excuse was, "Well, we got to drop this sometimes to get to that, and then come back to it." Well, mm -hmm. why haven't you finished? Because it's supposed to have a big, bigger cargo. What's going on with that? What is it causing you not to finish that ship within a within the time period that you've had to work on it? Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I'm a, I'm always excited about what they're doing, but even with this episode, and I love Jared, and I think ever since Jared's got back on, gotten on here, he's taking this program and whatever program he's, he's done throughout the years, the six years, through a different level. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love the transparency. I'm not all for giving that much transparency because I want them to work on the game. Mm -hmm. But I can understand how some people can be a little bit miffed if you're saying, well, with the with the tourist, uh, you know, we're working on it, and but then we stop here to pick something else. Well, how, how many times are you going to stop? Right. 
with the Taurus. Of all because six. the Aquila is out, the Phoenix is out, the um, uh, Andromeda is out, and we people are still waiting on that. Mm -hmm. Now the BMM, okay, I understand because they talked about the Defender and all this good stuff, and they use the Defender for the big deal with that. So I understand uh, that they're expanding, and I understand that they they haven't even given us a really finalized concept. I get that. I'm willing to accept them on that one, that pushback. But I, but you, you have to be able to relate to those people, and otherwise, I'm, I'm excited for game development. They have to give us a little bit better of an of a reasoning for them pushing back certain uh, certain things. And I think what we saw here wasn't just enough for me to say, mm -hmm. "Okay, I get it. I got, I got it." It yep. was just like, "Okay, here, here it is. It is what it is, and that's it." Yeah, the Taurus has been a disappointment for a lot of people because it is. Um, First of all, it was always considered as like a base constellation. The The only physical difference in it is that it does not have the uh, docking area for a Merlin. Uh, it has the extended cargo, but I think most of us feel like if that's the only difference, if that's the only thing that has kept that from coming out, it doesn't make sense. That, so that whole constellation series would be a complete series if it was out. So I don't get why that ship has gotten held up. A lot of other ones, I get it because we've talked about metrics that weren't, didn't exist. We're talking about design. Like, for example, you mentioned about the Banu. They had to create the whole Banu looking world. I get that. But some ships, uh, particularly early concepts like that, I don't get. Um, I do, when you mentioned about the Genesis Starliner, I think we've already had this conversation about those early concepts. We think that they're all going to grow in size just because metrics didn't exist back in 2012 through 2014, at least not the design metrics that they now have come to say, this is how a certain ship is made. This is the height of doors, the width of doors, the size of beds, all that stuff wasn't there. All they had was artist renderings in the early days and hence why they had to go back and redo some ships and why a lot of those earlier ships had to grow in size in order to match metrics over time. So it is a bit frustrating. I agree 100% with that. Um, and like Gigi said, there's sometimes some of the stuff they say, it seems like there's just a lot of filler that's going on, but it's yeah. not really coming down to the exact, yeah. okay, this is what the issue is. It feels like obfusc obfuscation, you there know you what go. I mean? Like yep. they're right. just dancing the around the point so that they don't have to make a point. Mm -hmm. And that is very aggravating. Mm -hmm. Right, it's aggravating and, and in some ways it's insulting. Yep. And, and, and the other thing is, is one more thing that like I want to put out. Intelligence is so low that I don't know what's happening. Mm -hmm. Right, right. The other thing that I also want to put out, Griff, is if you, uh, and I, I made a little note on this on the side, was mm -hmm. the ship, the ship, uh, <laughs> spawning. Mm -hmm. I mean, just put a version out there. How many versions of flights, uh, uh, of flight modes have they had? Four now? I believe mm -hmm. they're on three or four. How many versions of Planet Tech have they have? I believe they're on four. Right. So, it, uh, I mean, it, it's, um, what are you, do you, are you going to go ahead and put it as an inventory? Mm -hmm. So, or are you going to go ahead and increase the insurance? So when people do blow up an Andromeda, <laughs> then you got that insurance of the Andromeda and a, a, a Merlin attached to that. Um, I mean, what are you going to do? Put out something mm -hmm. so we can sit there and say version one wasn't great, but at least we put out something. Let's go ahead and perfect version two. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's that was another excuse that I was like, are you, are you saying? Are you, are you serious? Yeah. Are you serious? Just put out something. So, I'll say the one that really aggravated me was the one that Colossal talked about, the one with them talking about, oh, we just had to put it down and do these 33 things, yes, and then course. we picked it back. Mm -hmm. And that just don't, that don't sit well with me. Yeah, that didn't fly. A lot that of people have been waiting for that ship for a long time, and that's yep. the last ship to come out. And all we see in that ship what, is increased cargo space, something dealing with uh, some cargo space that cannot be detected. Right. We're still waiting on that to be in the game, but you put in the MSR, mm -hmm. but you mm -hmm. can't finish the Taurus. Yep. I mean, <laughs> yep. yeah, and the Taurus has been around since the earliest the earliest days. You know, it's 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 been around. That was the first, other than yeah. the uh, Auroras, that was RSI's. That's the flagship for them. And yet, people still. And I know plenty of people who have melted their Tauruses just because it was on the it was on the roadmap. I think it was either last year or early this year, and then it disappeared off the map. And people were really looking forward right. to it coming out. So it was another alternative way for people who like the constellation to do cargo in a much bigger way. But of course, those folks became a little bit frustrated. So um, Admiral Kusanagi says, these legacy ships should have a lot more priority. I agree with you all. Oh, we had to fix that and that. Fix what? Do they play the game? Okay, and those are very, very, very good points. Um, 
Yep, Gigi threw in that big word, obfuscation. That's what it happens when you're an English major. You start messing with people's heads at uh, midnight, <laughs> throwing in words like that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Listen. Okay, I don't need y'all sass today. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who sat in with us tonight, we really appreciate you guys hanging in here with us through both Inside Star Citizen and this SEL. It was a long SEL, but there was a lot of information. You guys know some nights we just kind of skip it and give an overview, but tonight there were a lot of questions that we felt were pertinent, especially to all you great ship owners out there so you could get updates on your ships. Um, we're going to get ready to wrap it up. As you guys know, each week when we end, we end with a machinima. And this week, I'm going to dedicate this one to Gigi. And I'll tell you why I'm dedicating it to Gigi. Uh, Gigi had told us that she was not going to buy any more ships, but she ended up buying a ship. <laughs> she got a ship uh, during IAE. And Colossal, I wanted to get all of the, the gang together. And this week, we're going to get Gigi to fly us around on her new ship. Okay? So... <laughs> We're all going to pile in and put our lives into her hand, if that makes sense. Uh, I'll but... be sure to get a couple of pillars on that. <laughs> okay, so Gigi, we're gonna we're gonna get the, give this we're gonna dedicate this particular video to you. You guys encourage Gigi to start flying her Cutlass. She has a new Cutlass, and uh, this is actually a video that was put out. I love this guy's videos, Alexander Beloff. Uh, he does Narian Seven uh, for those. You. Would you say Gigi? Uh oh, did we lose her? I think we lost her. Said I'll. I'm not. Ooh, we've got a real big frame drop going on with with Steam right now, guys. So hopefully you guys aren't seeing that. Uh, Fast Cart, if you're there, let me know if our stream is coming through good because we just got a huge stream drop. Gigi, are you hearing me well or no? We're good. Okay. All right. I hear you fine. You hear me? Yeah, you were you were doing the robot voice really bad for a second there, but we can hear you now. What were you saying? Uh, I was saying I will fly. Okay. Um, but I'm not flying y'all. Why? Because y'all gonna die. Because y'all gonna die. All That's right. why. Okay. So, so, okay. so back to my nice. back to my what I was saying. <laughs> We're going to put this video on to inspire Gigi. You guys encourage Gigi to fry. I know Gigi, she was frozen, but she's moving around now. Thanks, Fast Car. So we're going to put this video on to inspire her. It was done by, it's called Cutlass Black Cinematic, even though she has a Cutlass White because she has the IAE version. But I think it's a really cool video. And he always puts out great videos. So hopefully you guys, it's just a short one, but you guys enjoy it. If it plays. And it's not playing. Let's see here.
Okay, okay, okay. So, if uh, if that video doesn't make you want to go fly a Cutlass, I don't know what will. That was a very, very cool video by Alexander Beloff, better known as Narian7. We will, the link is already in chat, and of course we'll have it in our YouTube. But uh, he always puts out really, really cool videos. This video was, believe it or not, made in 2018. It's a couple years old, and I had never seen it before. But uh, GG, that should inspire you to break out your cutlass, okay? That's what we want you to do is uh, get your cutlass out this week. I gonna... will break out the cutty. All right, we're going to pile in, and uh, we're going to say a prayer as we go up. And uh, I think it'll be cool. You're not, look. <laughs> you know what? They can, you know, and people can okay. type this on chat if they know Colossal. But you can type it in chat, folks. If you and you can finish this up. If you live on a Drake, Colossal. You can type it up. Colossal. You die on a Drake. Colossal. <laughs> Love you, Gigi. <laughs> I do not need your sass. I, I don't think. I don't think that's a reflection on your piloting skills. I think it's just the whole Drake thing. But uh, that's a whole other story. Anyway, um, I mean, would you rather me have bought an origin ship, Colossal? Oh God, here we I, go. I, here I we go. I remember rights on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to even start on this whole thing down the origin road here, but Tessa uh, D, hi. We got Tessa D in the Oh, hey everybody. Tessa. Hey Tessa. Tessa. <laughs> Oh boy, I don't even want to go down this road. Um, so anyway, we're going to go ahead and get ready to sign off for the night. We do appreciate all of you all who hung out with us tonight. Um, I'm going to lock on here to Rosar. That's somebody who I've never seen before. Uh, Gigi, tell everybody where they can find you, please. You can find me pretty much on everything at the Green Eyed Gal. Make sure you put the before it because if you don't, it's not me. Okay? Cool. Awesome, awesome. And Colossal, where can people find you? You can find me here in Soul Citizens. I think I'll be on this Sunday with you. Yes, so, you are. Yep, yeah, so happy to be aboard and happy to always be on. So you can find me there with me and my silliness mm -hmm. and um looking forward to talking with you guys did on sunday <laughs> yeah no absolutely tessa yeah no sweetie we're sorry that we missed you even though you're probably streaming tonight uh but maybe you can come through sunday if you got some time we'll be on sunday at uh, 8 p.m eastern if you're around we're going to have uh stl youngblood is going to be our guest this sunday and again we're, that's the title of our show as you guys see on the screen it's called no deposit no return and for those of you who are old school people you'll know what that means. if you're a youngster if you're a millennial you have absolutely no idea what that phrase means and we will explain it to you on sunday but we think you i sure do not very... <laughs> you'll be i'm like very interested in this subject especially if you bought ships melted ships uh used credit over the past week you trust me you want to be at this show on this sunday so hopefully you guys can come and hang out with us on sunday we are going to raid rosar so you guys make sure you give him a shout he only has 18 people there hang in there for a few minutes with him just give him some encouragement and uh if you like what you see follow him send him some love from the soul citizens and thanks again everybody for hanging out with us tonight we know it was a long night it's late it's a friday but hope you guys have a great weekend please stay safe stay healthy take care of yourselves we'll see you guys in the verse and as always peace love and soul oh, see you guys later have a good one <laughs>